Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the TetraCast. This is RPG Site's weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. We are all awake and alive and here on time, the usual crew. My name is Brian Vitale. Joining me, I've got Josh Torres. It's April, and I'm the biggest fool. Adam Vitale. Hello. James Galizio. I fell for an April Fool's once, never again. And Chow Min Wu. I fall for them all the time. Yeah, it's it's hard not to like get excited about some of the stuff that you see on April Fool's. Uh, obviously, we're recording this uh, a couple days after, but we might have a few t- topics to talk about depending on where we go with our news discussion of this week. So this week, there is a bit more news to talk about. There really isn't quite a like a theme or a headliner, just kind of a bit of a hodgepodge. A few things that came up over the course of the, as we closed out March and entered into April. A lot of us are still tackling our backlogs. Adam went ahead and posted the April RPG site release calendar in terms of the games we are looking forward to this month. Chrono Cross is obviously a headliner. A few other games that are coming out. People have been finished finishing games like Stranger of Paradise and me myself, I finished Triangle Strategy. So for some of us, it's a backlog month. For some of us, it is uh, a month to look forward to a few games that are maybe flying under the radar. Uh, So we'll see. This week, we did have a bunch of features go up on the site. So some of these we're going to talk about as games we've been playing because they'll tie directly into those. So I wanted to go ahead and talk about these first. Uh, One of the features that went up on the site that might lead our first discussion point is Josh went ahead and put up a review for a a DLC that came out for Lost Judgment. This is Lost Judgment, the Kaito Files. So we talked about this release in in a newsworthy fashion a little bit earlier in one of our previous episodes of the podcast, basically talking about how it seemed like almost more like an expansion in the, in the classical sense, rather than like a, a typical DLC pack that you might have seen like in the more recent years. So I do know that Josh was able to play through this and put up his written thoughts on the site. And on top of that, I do know that James has also been uh, playing through the two Judgment games. So I'm going to hand it off to Josh to talk about specifically the Kaito Files DLC. And then we might also get to some James uh, impressions of the base game itself as we talk about this game from last year that we thought really highly of. So, Josh, take it away. What do you think about the Kaito Files? Yeah, it is pretty unconventional for us. We don't really do reviews on, like, DLC-type stuff. But I figured this is, you know, uh, kind of like an epilogue of sorts to, you know, well, uh, a game that I really, really liked uh, last year. So, Kaito Files, as the name implies, and the whole headliner for this DLC is that you play a different character. You play as Yagami's sidekick, Kaito. And Kaito plays very differently to Yagami. He has different uh, styles. You know, uh, Yagami had like Crane and Snake and I forget the other one. But Tiger. Tiger, yeah. And then uh, meanwhile, Kaito has a bruiser and tank. And, you know, he's in many ways, he's a ver- very much the opposite to Yagami. While Yagami is very careful and thorough and cautious, Yagami kind of throws caution to the wind. Is very brazen, very... Uh, straightforward, headstrong, and you know it's kind of the charming point about him is he, he's he's very honest about who he is and very like just out in the open. He's not really hiding much when you see him and when you talk to him. So he's always been one of the more entertaining characters out of Judgment's cast uh, to me. So this is like a brand new story. It takes place after the events of Lost Judgment. Um, it doesn't really, you know, it it it, it it's as so far as to like. It incorporates like the setup of Lost Judgment, which is very from the very beginning. There were two character side characters from the first Judgment that went out to make their own detective agency in another town, and then in Lost Judgment, very early on. And then you don't really you don't really need to know like the the takeaways of Lost Judgment and what happened to Yagami and everything in it to understand the Kaito files necessarily. But it just it's just nice to like just kind of serve as like an epilogue of sorts because this uh this dives into a brand new story. Um, where uh, Yagami is out of town, he's on to an- another case. So Kaito is kind of there in Kamurocho, uh, taking care of g- cases by himself. And so, wh- you know, very early on in the in the DLC, um, a client comes to- up to him. He's like, "Look, I'll pay you a lot for this job, and the job is uh, searching for his lost wife." Um, but the weird thing about this is the wife was pronounced dead two years ago and so it's like and then now he he, the the husband got word of like oh she's been seen around kamarocho it's like wait a minute that's something's not adding up 
you know like the, the wife's supposed to be dead so this uh, this kind of uh is a weird like obviously a weird premise and circ- uh, circumstance already and so when the client gives kaito the picture of the wife this uh supposedly dead wife is, was an old flame of his way back even for the events of the first judgment so it 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 relates to him personally as well it's like so do do both kaito and this client realize that this wife is supposed to be dead well that, that that's uh for the husband he like he knows that she's supposed to be dead like she was pronounced dead because of a you know of a suicide two years uh uh you know before you know the events of the kaito files uh kaito doesn't know at all he like he, he only realizes that like it was a past real, like old flame of his like when he sees the picture and then you know obviously i won't go into like deeper spoilers than that but that's kind of the whole setup of like okay kaito's been tasked to find this the the, the only thing I'll, the only thing I'll, I'll give is like initially like he he refuses this accept, uh, this request he's like this is i don't really want to do any uh, have anything to do with this this is kind of touching on some sore spots and like i kind of don't want to do any, anything with this but you know things arise in the in the dlc they kind of rope him into it and then a lot of the dlc as you're trying to find uh this dude's wife is you know it it, it brings up a lot of like kaito's past into it and you know where does he fit into all of this so you see a you know a good amount of flashbacks of like young kaito even before first judgment and like the kind of uh flashbacks you have a kaito then like so yeah you see a really young side to kaito and um you just see a lot of new like you know new sides to kaito as the story develops and that and it it is a pretty compelling plot like of like you know what you're doing but it is a very very smaller scope dlc it is 30 30 dollars on its own but it's not it's not like a a standalone separate app file it's part of the lost judgment uh executable so you have to you have to actually have lost judgment in order to access this DLC. Um, I mean, that's that's a but, nice uh, you know stipulation to make because it seems like more and more often uh, for DLC or expansions of that size or at least of that price point, publishers are more likely to say like, no, this is standalone. You can play it separately, and it's supposed to stand alone. Uh, like yeah, I, I, I know like, I just used the word standalone twice there, but it feels like this sort of thing is that's more common now than the than the classic mid twenty tens extra few hours of gameplay thing. maybe Go ahead, this James. is just me and i haven't played the dlc yet but the fact that it's a totally separate like option at the main menu and it has its own like separate credits i feel like since they're charging 30 bucks for it it probably should have also been like available standalone but maybe yeah, that's just me I, I, it, yeah it is, a, it is a curious thing like i wonder how difficult that would be to you know because you have to make a, se- a separate standalone page on the uh psn store and like however like it, it, i feel like that would be confuse people anymore it's like okay so like it's just there's both a separate file or separate app and then there's an option to go be into lost judgment it's like i think it's either one or the other and like i i understand why you know why it was part of this but making it available as both i think would confuse people any even more uh if yeah that the case. so so but like you know it's a, but there's just a, a heads up uh, for people who want to try it out but it took me it took me a thorough playthrough of it for me it took like about uh you know a, a, lo- a little over eight hours but if you're just going through it casually it's about five to six hours um it all takes place mostly in kamarocho that's like the only explorable space there's no side cases so you're, all you're really doing is moving from point to point in main story progress there are some side collectibles that you can get. So the main like gimmick of Kaito, uh, separate from Yaga, Yagami, um, is uh, early on in the skill tree, you can um, you can unlock these uh, skills that will allow you to like detect collectibles in a nearby zone, and they're like highlighted as like as a blue, like blue circle on your mini map when you get close to them. So detective when you're in vision. Them, yep, you 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 go into your first person detective vision, but he he has primal instincts. He has primal eye, primal nose, and primal ears. So, and, and like when you're running around town, like uh, and you go into this like detective mode in this zone, you'll hear like a cat meowing or Kaito rapidly sniffing. And it's like okay, um, 
so if either depending on what you hear or it's like you know cat meowing or the sniffing it's like okay i either know how to it, it pertains to his primal nose or his primal ears so if it's like it's sniffing you go into primal nose and you're just hearing him sniffing and then like and then you'll see like a little like red aura or sometimes like orange aura some sort of aura like faint aura uh in this like monochrome uh filter and then usually this uh, this aura is colored and then so you go into it and then you zoom in and then you sniff it and then that's how you get the collectible and then like for the cat meowing it's like your typical how in the first judgment it was just hey go find the cat that's meowing um but th- that's kind of the the main gimmick of kaito so like in main story stuff there'll be like investigation uh investigations where you don't have to only like use like his eyes you have to use his other senses to go find clues in the environment and piece together you know what's going on so that's kind of like the main um thing that separates him like gameplay wise because other than that you have you'll have the standard you know there's one like chase sequence there's a tailing mission there's some stealth sections and they're all just like in lost judgment um but the the he'll have like unique animations for stuff like in the running segment like if you're like trying to go up like there's a barrier in your way like a gate like you know like a little obstacle in your way usually yagami will just hop over it kaito will just like smash through it uh you know so that they have little little visual uh, cues that differentiate them like that, um, but it's a. Uh, I think the weird thing that, the like the pacing of the DLC is weird because like you have a fairly natural flow to the DLC until the final chapter. And there's they already said it's four chapters, so you know because you get to the fourth chapter, it's quite beefy. But like it kind of lays all like the entire story like laid bare on you through like a conversation between Kaito and another person. But it's like it's one of those conversations that like I it's it's very much the he here's we have to tell you this story because like the actions you did to get up to this point makes sense, but it didn't give you enough like clues in that journey to really fill you in on on what's actually going on. Like what I like about Judgment One and Lost Judgment is as you're going through Yagami's journey that you're it's 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 spread out in a way that like you can connect the dots on your own it obviously like later on it'll like you know it'll tell the player like exactly what's going on but even before that point like you can see like oh okay like i pieced like 90 percent of this together and that was like the missing thing that like i couldn't like quite connect the dots with but uh, like looking back i can see why like that that's the that, that's the thing that i couldn't like I could I could see it now. I can see it now. Not that now that I know. While in this one, it's like once you, once they tell you what's going on, it's like there's no way I could have like oh, know that, like that. Uh, know that prior because of like they the, they don't give you enough like details uh, as you're going through it. To and I feel like it's one of those t- types of DLCs that like it had a more broader scope than. Like what do you what you actually got? It's like what you actually got is still good, but like I, I'm sure if like if this was like had more development time or w- whatnot, or if they had like if the original plans were like, hey, this was supposed to be have like one more chapter, like really bridge the gap between you know what you learn here and then to the final chapter. But the way you describe that, that reminds me of Yakuza Three. Near the mm-hmm. end of that game, you have like a conversation. It's I've never played the Judgment game, so I have to yeah. draw from my Yakuza experience. Uh, it's like Kiryu and Date um, talking to like a police chief that he's only in three. I don't remember his name. He's not a repeated character. And he, there's like a 50 minute long conversation where he's like, this is what the story is actually about. And it was like the worst example of that in the Yakuza series where it wasn't like bad, but it just felt like they're like, Oh crap. We, uh, the game's got to wrap up. Let's, let's just tie everything up nice and neatly in this conversation where this one character knows how all the things fit together. Cause we didn't quite convey it to the player properly. So here it is. Now I hope you enjoyed that. Go fight the final boss. And that, the yeah. way you described it just kind of reminded me kind of like of that. So uh, mm-hmm. I guess RGG has used that sort of storytelling crutch, I guess before, at least Absolutely. in the way that you uh, yeah. mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah, it's that definitely. It's not nothing new for RGG Studio to to use that. And you know, hopefully, as they move on, you know, Lost Children was be- was better about it than you know most of their other past works. But um, like, uh, it, it's pretty cool. Like you know, um, Kai- like playing Kaito like in battles is really fun. There, there's like a lot of little nods to like past Yakuza games, like his tank stance. 
Uh, it reminds you of Beast Dance from Yakuza Zero because you know as you're doing his square strings, it'll pick up like nearby objects uh, as you're attacking in, in that uh, string, much like that uh, Yakuza mm. Zero style. Um, and then, the, but they have their own little quirks that differentiate them. Like in that same stance, he has like an instant block, like deflect mechanic. Like if you instantly block right before an uh, enemy like uh, connects with you, like they'll bounce off of you, and then you'll get a defensive buff. And then, like, and then later down that like take style skill tree, you can like unlock that buff, and then like you can carry it over to the other style when you switch styles. And then, like, vice versa with like Bruiser, like Bruiser is very much offense oriented, um, and like he can actually like he, he can actually parry attacks by attacking this at the same time as a, a person attacks. So they like, kind of like bounce off of like you as you're attacking, and like your attack speed goes up. Um, and then he has like really wrestling move, heat moves, and it's, it's really cool. It's like you know you can really feel like uh, Kaito's a fucking beast in, in combat, and it, it it conveys that very well. Um, I mean, no, I, no, I, go for it. Uh, like, honestly, I expected that uh, that he would play uniquely, but I actually do kind of like that the idea of you train in a certain stance, but you carry it over into the other stances. It kind of gives you a sense of progression and not just like, well, I've only trained up beast stance, so I don't have bruiser or whatever the other two, the two names are. So I just like that in principle as a, like a design uh, philosophy. Yeah. The, the, the one thing I don't like about like the progression in this game, like uh, skill progression wise is that a good chunk of like your skills that you unlock are tied to collectibles. So let's say you want to get more SP from combat. Um, uh, so you have to get these Matsugani family crests from like the collectibles where you can sniff out or hear them out in the overworld. And like, like that's the easier part of them. It's like because there's actually zones like you can tell like okay, there's a collectible here, and there had that that collectible happened to be this family crest. Uh, while other ones like like the cooler skills that like actually unlock moves for them. Like are tied behind these things called memory points, and these memory points are like shiny collectibles in the environment, but they're only really noticeable if like you're near them, and they're scattered all throughout Kamurocho. And some of them are like in like you know like the more memorable spots, like maybe the detective agency or the 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 office, the agenda office that uh, Yagami you know helps out with. But then it's just like you don't really know because there's no like in-game indicator or thing that you can lock that says, hey, the, there's a memory point around this area. So, like, if you really want to unlock the whole skill tree, you'll have to, like, scabber around Kam Kamurocho and look for these shiny collectibles that, like, you don't really have a good clue on where they are. So, it kind of it kind of sucks that, like, hey, I can't... Like, there was actually a point, like, you know, at, like, later in the game of the uh, Kaito files where I had so much skill points, but I couldn't distribute them anywhere because they didn't have the memory points to unlock, like, the skills to be purchasable. So, yeah, like, so I, I just praised them for like the design philosophy of how they progressed the two trees alongside, but that just seems like I don't know. Then they become more than collectibles at that point. Yeah, exactly. Because you really want to see, hey, you know, I want to see what else this dude can do. But then they're they're like gated behind like these hidden hidden things in the environment, and you're just like, well, I don't really want to go scour for them, and you know, look up and down Kamarocho for the umpteenth time after playing all these Yakuza games, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, that that's kind of a that, that was kind of a bummer but uh, overall it's a it's a fun like little dlc that like hey if you like kaito go for it it's it's well worth it but the ramifications of it i think will have to be addressed in uh a later judgment sequel if they decide to make one because i think the what what happens in it is like too big to ignore so but that was i was actually going to ask that like does this feel very self-contained side story or does this feel like it has implications that must be carried forward and you seem like you're there, there are definitely the things later. yeah 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 there are definitely things that like you know for kaito specific, specifically that like they have to acknowledge i because it would feel too weird if they didn't is yagami um, out of the screen the whole time or does he make up an appearance or um he doesn't make an appearance he's like he, you could you talk to yagami via text but he's never like their model or on voice it's like it's just text conversations with him saying oh you know like how's that how's that case you're working on you know, and so forth, but you never really see him on screen. You don't, you don't hear his voice. Uh, so, you know, he still exists, but not like, but he's just out of town. All right. Um, I think I like that because it, it makes it so like this DLC is about Kaito. There is no Yagami showing up at the end or whatever. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's what I liked about it too. Um, the, uh, other than that, I, I, all, all I'll say is like, it has one of the most unique final boss premises in the whole Yakuza 
judgment verse. It, it is it is really refreshing in a strange way. Are you <laughs> are you fighting on a rooftop? No. <laughs> okay, because it, yeah. it always seems like you're either fighting on top of the Millennium Tower or potentially a hospital. But yeah, it's oh. a it's a it's a fun ride. All right, so obviously that came out just a, a few days ago, and Josh has his write up up on the site for the review for that DLC. Now, before we move on from that conversation, I do want to just allow James, if he wants to, I know he's been playing through Lost Judgment and uh, had some thoughts on it that he had shared in like incidental chats throughout the week. I don't know if you wanted to voice any of those, what you've had here, or if you've been able to finish the game yet. Yeah, I finished it last night. Um, I don't think I talked about Judgment on the podcast because I think the week that I played it was pretty heavy on the news so we just didn't get around to it so might have been nintendo direct week or something yeah something like that what's the best way to put it i was not a huge fan of the original judgment i thought the story was generally pretty good but i had a lot of issues with specifically the storytelling um some of that also like carries forward to Lost Judgment. Specifically, one of the things that I had an issue with was, and it's been so long since I played Yacht Zero, I'm sure there was some of the, those issues there too. It's just, there are some really, really fucking weird ways that they uh, handle women in, in the Judgment series. It's really, really bad in context. It's oof. It's yeah, something that our RGG has kind of they make they take strides in some areas, but then in others, there's decisions that just seem kind of I don't want to say weird, but unusual. Like I think of uh, how in uh, Yakuza Seven, how the the leader of the of the Korean faction, even though she is portrayed as an antagonist in that game, because uh, there are no f female like enemies in that game, like she doesn't ever fight you directly; she only fights you through like a proxy and things like that. Yeah, I forget her name right now. I wish I had it on me, but I just don't. Yeah, but. yeah. So it's a, things... like, uh, like I'll just, I'll just mention it because uh, James and I have, have, like, you know, talked about it here. It's like not, not here, but like, you know, else, elsewhere, like uh, DMs and stuff. Like, uh, like I, I told, I, I don't know if I told you, James, or I told another person. I was like, that, like, I think it was about Sayori, and then it's like, I, I was like, I'm sorry, dude, but in Lost Shows, they kind of doubled down on the Sayori thing that happened in the first <laughs> Judgment. Yeah, well, here's the thing about the Sayori stuff. I think overall, the way they handled it, well, they do they handle some things about it better in Lost Judgment and some things much worse. Like, at least there's not a section in Lost Judgment where you play as Sayori in first person as you walk to the cabaret club as you're constantly being sexually harassed the entire time. Uh, but on the other hand, there's workplace harassment because both of her co-workers at Gunda Law end up, while she's supposed to be undercover, going to the same cabaret club that she was undercover at, and basically and knowing full well that she had to act like she didn't know them and treat them with all this. Like, it was such a weird, yeah, it was, it was like one of the weirdest segments of the game that I'm like, it doesn't have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they flanderized the hell out of Hoshino because it's like, yeah, he was a little bit weird about that crush in the first game, but it was like still innocent enough. And then after Lost Judgment, it's like, bro, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but, now, I do know yeah, that we, yeah. I do know that when we discussed Lost Judgment at the end of the year last year, uh, Josh talked at length about how it was a huge improvement in the storytelling of the main narrative. Oh, did, did I, you... I completely agree. I, I know quite a few people that actually dislike, well, not dislike, they didn't like Lost Judgment story as much as the first one. And honestly, I don't understand why, because like the storytelling itself and not to mention the cutscenes, like the frame, the cutscenes is so much better. Like I, I believe, well, one thing I did talk about in the staff channel uh, earlier was how this one cutscene between Yagami and this teacher at uh, Sadio uh, Sawa on the roof is just incredibly powerful. And there are many cutscenes like that where they just the way they handle like the framing and the music. I I'm so sorry, Josh. I can't believe I didn't trust you when you said the music was so much better in Lost Judgment. You're you're right. <laughs> like. 
Mm-hmm. And again, without getting into spoilers, um, man, the antagonist for Lost Judgment is so good because it's like, even though it's like, you can be like, yeah, you're in the wrong, but it's also like, but is he really condemnable? And it's like, at the end, it's, it, you're left at, you're left there, at yeah, the there are definitely like players. Yeah, there are definitely lost children players that's like, I don't know how I feel about this because I kind of agree with the antagonist. <laughs> you know, it kind of really makes yeah. it, it'll hit different for, you know, every single person of like where you fall on that. You know. I mean, let me put it this way. I was bullied in middle school, so that definitely mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, had an impact on how I felt about it. I'll say that much. Yeah. Um, and all, especially that final boss theme is like, oh my God, so good. And the fact Death's that kiss. he uses... And the, the fact that doesn't tell you outright, but the final boss is using the same combat styles and switching between them. It's like, I see the parallels here. I see mm-hmm. what you're going for. It's like, Really good. It, it, it's such a shame about the uh, the uh, misogynistic stuff. Yeah. Because other than that, I'd say this is absolutely like a huge upgrade from the first one. Like from a playability standpoint alone, it's like if I were to rate Judgment versus Lost Judgment, the fact that I don't have to worry about uh, my HP bar getting capped from lethal attacks makes this game already <laughs> at least a, a full point higher. Because God, that was a terrible mechanic. There was a lot of weird mechanics in the first judgment that were like very experimental. Like you can definitely see it's like, okay, we want to experiment with this game, but like, the game suffered as a result as a result of that. Because <laughs> it's just yeah. like like the gang system in that game where like, you know, you you would oh here the gangs are here again. The increased encounter rate, it's like, oh boy, thanks. Yeah, yeah. And and, and if you like and you're like, I don't want to fight them and you don't fight them and you don't like end up going for the boss and the original the game basically gaslights you by saying, yo, my, my, my buddy got hurt because he didn't do anything. It's like, well, tough shit. I don't yeah. Want to- <laughs> but yeah, um, I think my own, besides the misogynistic stuff, my only mm-hmm. real complaint is I feel like they could have handled the school story stuff a bit better. Not mm-hmm. that the content itself is bad. Yeah. I just think that because of the pacing of the story and when you actually unlock the school stories, there doesn't feel like a good place to slot them in. And so many of the mini games are locked behind continuing along that story path. And as far as I can tell, you're going to be like 20 hours into the school stories before you unlock the final mini game. And that's like, if you just want to play the mini games, that's a bit of a slog. Like I understand, like maybe it would have been different because I've been trying to get through this quickly in time for, uh, 14 patch 6.1, which we'll be talking about later. And I didn't, I also want to play Kaito Files. If I, if I had nothing else I was playing and I could, and I was fully taking my time with this, maybe that would have been different. So maybe that's not entirely fair to the game, but it still feels like there wasn't really a good spot narratively. Where I, I, get, I guess that, that is a weird testament to the game's story pacing too. It's like it, that, that, it's that is a really common, good. That, yeah, yeah, that is a, that is a common thing. Like even throughout the like uh, friends that I've you know played the game, it's like you know what I'll do the mini games or like all the side content on a second playthrough because like the 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 main story just had them that hooked that it's like it's hard to pull myself out now that I'm this far in like invested in the story. Yeah. Like, I get it. I get it. I'm the only one who appreciates boxing and no one else. <laughs> Well, no, I have boxing because I uh, bought the season pass and it just gave me boxer style. Uh, like, I, I see. I didn't have that. And like, I, 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 I like the boxing mini game, like contained to that mini game and uh, taking it out of it. I feel like loses that luster, oddly enough. Yeah, well, I I played around with it for like a few minutes and I turned it off because it's like I, I I'm. But yeah, uh, Lost Judgment was basically the only game I played this week. Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I'm glad because I was feeling pretty down on the series after Judgment because it's like I'd heard so many people loved it so much. And then it just was like, yeah, not, not a big fan of it. But are you glad you played Judgment because of uh, preparing you for the sequel? I guess I'll ask both. Oh, of you this. yeah, like, yeah. I'll, I'll okay. be honest. Like, well, you probably could play Lost Judgment without having played the first one. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I, and I'm not surprised. And that kind of gives me my answer. Obviously, I played through 
the Yakuza series and I just finished six this January. So like now the next two are the two judgment games for me. So that's kind of why I'm asking. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to playing through those. And just as a reminder, like lost judgment did win our best, uh, writing and storytelling last year. And it sounds yeah, and like both of you kind of agree it. with that. Yeah. And then it was also, uh, obviously one of our, uh, top five RPGs of the year. So, Another feature that went up on the site that maybe we'll let uh, James talk about is that he did write a review for The Cruel King and The Great Hero. This is a Nipponichi game that released last year in Japan, but is releasing, uh, or just, sorry, just released in March this year. And I do know that you've been talking about this a bit, like, casually in chat, but I don't know if you've ever talked about your experience with this game on the podcast. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Just wanted to get, now that you put your written review up on the site, like your final thoughts on uh, on this game. Yeah, sorry, just give me one second. I I don't think I talked about any. Last I don't think so either. Game. Like right. so, uh, that's kind of why I wanted to give you the opportunity here, at least at least to just kind of talk right, about yeah, what, yeah, what I, you covered in your review. All right. Yeah. So I didn't talk about. It. I talked about Tunic last week. Um, Again, this is uh the Cruel King and the Great Hero. Yeah. So. I think we have all had games where we reviewed them, we played them, and while there might have been some really cool aspects of it, like the game as a whole had so many issues that it was like impossible to recommend. And sometimes, at least for me, there's some games like that where it just it feel kind of bad. Because you can tell that the game was made with a lot of passion. But it doesn't change the fact that the game's not really good. Like an, it's when it's when you wish you could recommend it, but you're already thinking yeah. of like the reasons why you shouldn't or how you should caveat it. Yeah, and it's like I, I, I'm going to assume it's not just something that I've dealt with. It feels like it would be a fairly universal like experience when you're reviewing games. Though again, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but. Has anyone else had that? Uh, it, it might be uh, the very next game we talk about after <laughs> this. Oh, all right then. Um, long story short, so I put my review out. If you want to get my full uh, thoughts, you can just uh, read the review. Long story short, um, I don't think Cruel King and the uh, Great Hero should have been in RPG. Or failing that, it should have been heavily reworked. Uh, the main issue I had with it was that the battle system is so simplistic because you just have regular attacks and then skills. And the way that skills work is that you need to expend energy to use them and you get one energy per turn by default or two if you guard that turn. And most of the skills that actually deal extra damage and whatnot cost like three, four five energy, something like that, which means that when you're trying to go through the game world, which again, it's random encounter. Well, it's random encounters, so it's not like you can really avoid anything. Um, it's just, the combat so itself it's, isn't good. It's so, so the, simple. The, it ends up being like attack, 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 skill, attack, 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 skill. Yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. And then like when you get to the bosses, it's just like, there's no real, like, there is a bit of um, planning and using the proper skills, but only in the sense, it's nothing really hard. So instead of it being a challenging encounter, every boss feels like it has, like, three times as much HP as, as it probably should. Um, which is weird, because the main thing that sticks out to me is that this game is very clearly meant to have a an emphasis on the story. And I'd say that some of the side quests have some really interesting stuff. It's it's very the game itself is very clearly meant to be for young like for kids, for for younger players, and there's a number of morals in it. And they're legitimately like good morals. And there's some really interesting side quests and there's like, it touches on some more like mature subject matter, but not in a sense that it's like, it, it's, it's respectful. And, and I've really appreciated that. But then you look at everything else in the game, like the poor level design, the uh, poor combat system, the oppressively high encounter rate. And then the worst part of it all is that 
even the best parts of it, the story and whatnot, is hampered by what's honestly uh, not a great localization. Uh, there's multiple uh, moment. There were multiple moments where I would run into a text box which had uh, text overflow issues, including some parts of the user interface. But uh, more than that, like even stuff that didn't have overt issues, you could tell that the game didn't really get much of an editing pass because there's like so many sections where it's like the dialogue is stilted or there is grammar mistakes. And while I'm always understanding of uh, um, changes between Japanese and English, because one thing that you really need to understand when you're like critiquing this stuff is that we don't know what like stipulations the engine had. We don't know what the uh, text limitations were. We don't know what NIS America had to work with in regards to how they could fit the translation into a text box. And there's definitely some telltale signs where things might have been stricter maybe than they were used to. And it's just one of those things that it's like people don't talk about, especially not reviewers, because it's not something we generally think to consider. But it doesn't change the fact that the localization is, as it's presented, not very good. Right. So there might have been a boundary condition saying you need to find an appropriate way to convey this. But by the way, you have a character limit. Otherwise, that's or or, or a certain number of lines and better make it work because, you know, that's not going to come through. The limit that you have isn't going to come through in the output, but people are still going to read what you have and see if there's a mistake or a text overflow or things like that. So overall, it's like I gave it a five out of 10. And it's like, there, I'll say this, listen to the soundtrack. The soundtrack's great. It's uh, the vocal themes are from the same person. What's her name again? That did the vocal theme, some of the vocal themes for uh, Umi Neko. So that's, uh, that's really good. It's like uh, the game had a great first impression for me when I opened it up and I was at that title screen. And I heard that vocal theme. It's like, ah, that's really good. That's a really good sign. And there's like a lot of charm to it. The storybook aesthetic is really re well done. I, I love how the save screen is a bunch of bookmarks <laughs> because it's supposed to be like a storybook, like the limited edition that, they, um, that they're selling is the storybook edition and all that. It's all well and cool, but it also is like, well, if you... If you understand it's supposed to be like a storybook it makes the localization issues all the more uh, uh disappointing yeah yeah so if you want to hear uh, james's full thoughts on the cool king and the great hero he did have a review up on the site uh it sounds like it was unfortunately disappointing but it might be a cool theme or a cool uh premise for you so go ahead and check it out if you think it still seems interesting yeah, unfortunate that it's a game that you want to recommend, but have kind of substantiated reasons why you don't feel like you should or can, at least to not the extent that you'd like to. All right, looking uh, forward towards other features that have been put up on the site in the last week. Uh, while James is talking, and this one we can kind of just briefly touch on because uh, we've talked about this game at length. Uh, you did talk about how the new collaboration, well, collaboration isn't the right word, but the, the addition of the Arceus event in Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl based on the progress made in Pokemon Legends Arceus, you, I think you had talked about how you felt about that implementation of what in prior years used to just be a, a mystery gift code that you'd plug in. So maybe you can just talk briefly about your experience being able to access that event in this, I guess, new paradigm of how these two games, were, which released in, you know, within two months of each other, kind of paired off like this and uh, gave reason to progress through both games in order to see an event that used to be just hidden behind a mystery gift code. Well, no, I, the reason I actually uh, pitched this feature is uh, there's a little more depth to this than just it being like a retread of a mystery gift code because this event never released for diamond, pearl and platinum. It was in the code. And like, if you like action replayed the Azure flute into your inventory, you'd be able to access it. It was never officially released. I assume and that it had released like once, like there was some weekend in the no. summer of 2008. Really, yeah, not no, even in no. Japan? Not even in Japan. Oh, so that's, uh, that's what, me. yeah, that's what makes this so special because for a lot of people my age that were really into Pokemon, I mean, yeah, it never released, but everyone was aware of it. Like, and people played it through relative, like, action replays. Yeah, yeah, action replays were like relatively common then. 
So people knew it existed. And so for the longest time, because we're kids and we didn't know any better and like, we just assumed, well, is there another way to get the Azure flute that we just don't know of? Was it really supposed to be a mystery gift or is there something that we're missing? And obviously that wasn't the case. I'm pretty sure like the reason they didn't release it is it didn't make sense. Like from what little narrative Pokemon has where it's like, why are you just being able to catch Pokemon God? And it's like, um, I think the way they handled it here both kind of answers that. Assuming that is the reason. Again, don't quote me on it. It's been so long. I just, it sounds like something I remember reading. Uh, I mean, I had always assumed that people were using the action replay just because they were playing Pokemon Platinum in the summer of 2011 or 12 and they'd missed their chance or something like that. Because that's how I had played it, I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they could have just made this a mystery gift, a limited time mystery gift. And um, there's definitely some people I've seen that seem like they would have preferred that just because they feel like, well, I don't want to have to buy Pokemon Legends Arceus in order to get access to the event, this event in Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl. And they've said that it's a bit of a cash grab. And while I can understand that that impression, it doesn't quite feel that way to me when you consider the stipulations that you have to meet in order to even access this event. Because it's not just having Pokemon Legends Arceus save data, uh, save data. No, specifically, you need to have save data after having caught Arceus in Pokemon Legends Arceus, which requires finishing the Pokedex. <laughs> so, which we've talked about on the podcast is quite a uh, quite a task. Yeah. So. It, <sighs> Well, sure, the end result is you still need to own both games. I It feels, may, and maybe it's just me, it does feel more like a reward for seeing things through to the end in, in one game rather than being like, hey, go buy this game. Because it's still a lot of an ask, and it's not just like, oh, pay to get an Arceus. It's more like, it feels more like a bonus for people that have finished both games. I can agree with that. Rather than saying like, here's the Arceus event, you know, DLC 499 instead having it tied to your progress in a game that released in the same window in the same region. I don't know. I think it's an interesting take and I, I don't think I have any problems with it. Yeah. As long as it's not time limited. I mean, I think it's just, it's the, like you said, the, a nice bonus to like, I just, I got thank you, you know, for, you know, play, playing our game and beating it. Yeah, and like considering this event never released originally, like I, I believe they actually did see some data for the event in uh, Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl version 1.0, but it got scrubbed with uh, the day one patch. So people assumed it was just never coming over and there was no, no expectation that would ever happen because it never happened for the original game. That's the precedent, yeah. Yeah, so... People saying, oh, I don't want to have to buy RCS. I mean, sure. That's a fair enough like standpoint, but but what you're missing is just like a little a bonus. It's not yeah. like essential to the story of the game. Yeah, and for me, it's just like being able to access this event like legit for the first time in 15 years. Well, ever like 15 years after the games first came out in the West, it's just like man, it's well. I mean, you it's can not, see it on yeah, and the headlines like it's a bit of a like childhood dream come true as corny as it is to say yeah i mean it's, it's like nostalgia for something that you couldn't access legitimately now being like fulfilled or satiated so i think that is a cool uh, a cool take we do have a couple other features on the site but they are from uh other staff contributors so we'll go through those uh, in a moment so before we get to those we'll talk about some other games that podcast participants have been playing in the moment and we will hand it back over to josh who has been playing uh, an indie title that we brought up on the podcast as something that i thought had a really neat marketing cycle and a really neat trailer for it and that was anno mutation m so i know that josh has been playing through this somewhat and i was able to watch some of his gameplay uh about a week ago or so so i don't know if you've made more progress on this or what your current thoughts are or if you've dropped it just what are your thoughts on anon mutation m so far i'm about a little over eight hours into it i'm still making my way through it i don't know how close i am to the end i have, I have no like it's hard to really 
With the way things are going, it I have no idea how close I am to the end, to be honest. So, Anna Mutationim uh, comes from an indie developer, uh, Thinking Stars, and this was part of the the China Hero project that Sony uh, was talking about a while ago. Uh, you know, basically a financial commitment and for marketing to you know uh, these uh, indie de- indie developers, and uh, it's it's sort of a weird thing because. When you see trailers or screenshots for this, you'd think, oh, this is like an action game. It's like very heavy on the action and it seems really cool. And like th- there is action. It's like a t- it's like a 2D base, you know, uh pixel uh side scroller in some uh some aspects. You have like, you know, your sword, your great sword and a gun, and then you can like uh, jump and dash uh, you know, uh, through enemies, and you have a skill tree to upgrade these, and then eventually you get, you know access to like these twin daggers and you can swap that out for your sword and you know the it, it, it's like your in, in some ways it's your standard action rpg game uh which feels like it, it feels fun it's that um th- this is a weird one so the the premise of an- anno action uh, a- anno mutation M is um you play this uh woman named Anne, and it's uh set at like in this uh cyberpunk uh city and you know she and has this like weird illness uh where she, sometimes she goes berserk and she doesn't recall when she goes berserk um only like you know the people tell her that you know that she went berserk and so in the beginning of the game you know she she meets up with her friend uh ayane and then it's kind of kind of weird because ayane is like your uh sidekick but she's always at her home so she's like she assists you via this hologram um so the, you get a lot of character interaction with them, you know. Ayane is like calls her darling and everything, and it's adorable. And so they're they're trying to find a way to cure her illness. And then this story uh, sort of transforms into, you know, as she's trying to find a way to cure her illness, she finds out that one of her uh, brothers is missing, uh, Ryan, because he's trying to find a cure for her as well. So you kind you're kind of for a good chunk of the game where I'm at at the moment is trying to find Ryan and kind of going to places that very where he's been uh because you don't want you know want him to come into harm's way for your sake because that, that that's crazy but the the weird part about this game is I really really dig like the the cyberpunk world building like there are some really neat aspects to like build the world in a way of like okay there's mecha, there's this uh mechan virus going on where it turns like people uh, or parts of them into machines, it's like really deadly for them. And uh, you know, some people have learned to cope with it. Some people have like found a way to like, you know, cure it. Uh, cure it. Uh, but you know, not but not all of not all parts of society, not all layers of society has as yeah uh, access to this cure. So it it you know there are definitely um, layers to it in the world building, and uh, a lot of this is conveyed to like you know through posters in the environment. Through like newspaper articles, through notes, and you know, you kind of get a, uh, you kind of start peeling back the layers on like what's going on in the world through that, and I think that's actually really cool because they they've set up this whole entire intricate world, but the actual base story of Anne trying to find Ryan is like kind of dull to me. Like uh, the only the only characters I care about is Ayane and sometimes Anne. Anne is like not really a compelling main character either because she's very kind of too basic too simple in my opinion she's she's a badass but she's kind of there's kind of nothing more to her than that at the moment even eight hours in and while, while the trailers like definitely show like the cool parts of the action a lot of this game is divided between that action and like adventure game segments where you're just simply you know roaming around like you know the city at some parts then roaming around like like uh other places you, you you go to like like an underground sewer and a lot of it is like oh there's npcs around and you scour the environment for materials because you can use them to craft new weapons and consumables um and that part of it isn't really that appealing to me because so there's so much of it like i'd say on a ratio of like action game segments to adventure game segments it's like it feels 75 to 25 uh uh on that scale and it, it what frustrates me about the adventure game segments is they could be more like they would wrap up more nicely if like i wasn't compelled to like just scour the environment like what uh, seeing the waiting to see which highlights are highlightable to open and interact with and get their materials because like 
when you when you visit this uh, an environment you don't actually know what's interactable there's no way to like scan your environment and see okay these are the things that are interactable you kind of just have to like walk up to something and see if it's interactable or not and like like say and like the same asset like say this crate like say it's like a, a blue and white crate like uh, this blue and white crate is not universal language of like this is interactable in some in some interactable but in others it's not so you just you just don't really don't know or have a great sense of like what's interactable and what what's not in that environment in your environment i was actually so. gonna say like i actually kind of like the idea on paper of not having like a highlight button as long as the art or the design still makes it clear but you, what you just described basically says nope it doesn't because yep, the same exactly. asset can sometimes be interactable and sometimes not and i just want to make sure i also got your your ratios correct are you saying it's like three to one three times as much action as as adventure or the other way around other way around it's three times more adventure the, uh, the, the, the action oh you said well, you said it flipped before so yes it's mostly yeah. like an adventure game yeah it's more action segments uh, yes action section. yeah yeah so and like because like like think about it like this like in the first six hours of the game it feels like i was doing like about four and a half hours of it wasn't really in the action segments like it, it was mostly just like kind of wandering around the environment and like you know getting to know like the world but like there wasn't really anything that like was like you're really going on in the story that was like really compelling and like, right sure there so were some now segments. i understand why you brought up the story thing because there's nothing wrong with the game being mostly an adventure game but you also had just mentioned how you weren't compelled by the character or the plot of trying to find ryan when if that's what you're trying to carry the game but also the game is mostly adventure and that's not interesting then i understand why you're kind of having a lukewarm time yeah so like like i'm getting through it uh, you know it's probably slower than i want to but like it's just there's like not a lot of hooks like every time i pick it up it's like all right there's like more adventure stuff there are some gameplay segments i, I it does pick up a little bit as you, you as you get through it but then it the combat itself doesn't isn't really that engaging either because like it definitely wants to like be a devil may cry of sorts it has that aspiration but it doesn't have like the the tightness of a devil may cry game to really support even if as you get more upgrades so like at at, at this point all, all i'm doing in combat is like uh i unlock this uh attack upgrade and uh, and uh for the, my sword it's like a, a down like a down attack uh, like on the ground that has like a big like aoe like um attack rage and it does a ton of damage because i've just been juicing attack and like this is all the combat for me now because I can just easily go through enemies with that attack with very little trouble. There, there's very little like things that are like a threat to me at this point. So it's just like there are things about the combat that are cool conceptually, but don't really um, add up. Like for example, there's this instant kill mechanic where uh, enemies have like a, a shield gauge, and then like when you Take down that shield gauge. It's like, oh, press RB to do an instant kill. But instant kill doesn't really mean instant kill. It just means go into this attack animation that does a lot of damage to them, but it's not an instant kill, you know? <laughs> so it's just, okay, you can do a finisher that doesn't finish them, and then you can continue to wail on them, and then they'll go down, like, easily. And so it's just... Uh, it, it, I, I, it, was, it was more promising earlier on, and then once I got deeper into it, um, it's just... It, it's, there's something about it just not really connecting for me. And I'm wondering, like, will this, will I, will I eventually feel good about it um, later on, or who knows? And like the latest update from them from the 28th, um, from March 28th was, oh, we're good, we're working on new content coming soon. So it's like, what does that mean, you know? Because like, who knows? But it's just, it's, it, 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 there's something really cool about it. But I think there's there's too much in the way that like kind of obfuscates that, and it doesn't really help that like the pixel art itself isn't like the, it it doesn't really do much for me like uh, because the because the the pic the the whole in, the environment that you're wandering isn't all pixel art either. It's like a lot of three D models with some two D assets in them, but it's main, mainly three D models. So the pixel art, in contrast to the background, looks like cardboard cutouts. Uh, as well um in a weird way too so it's kind of you know uh, it's not it's not bad but there's You're something that's not it. clicking yeah there's the, there's something that's really not clicking for me and i think that's just that's just like a lot of little things that like just add up 
So it's just like, uh, well, I, 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 I intend to finish it. I do, I do intend to write a review on it. It's just, you know, right, right now, it's just like, mm, yeah. So know. it sounds like, unfortunately, and I understand why you kind of alluded to this when we were talking about. Uh, I assume this is what you were alluding to when you mentioned to James, like a game that you kind of yeah. want to recommend, but there's just footnotes and caveats and bullet points. So you're like, but right. I have to bring up these other things. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I recommend it, honestly. I can see why other people might. I'm just like, I don't know yet. Well, I'm watching the trailers, I feel it's probably not clicking because it's like misadvertised. It, I feel like it's an action game watching the trailer. Exactly, right? Yeah, you see a trailer for it, it's like, oh, it's an action game. That's cool. And then, like, and then it's definitely some parts of it are, but most, most of it is not. So, a few other games that have released recently. We obviously had a big uh, podcast, I think, two weeks ago, where we had Scott on to talk about Stranger of Paradise, which is a release from uh, mid March that several of us have played already. But I do want to at least give Adam an opportunity to talk about Stranger Paradise because I do know that he basically, as far as I understand, kind of marathoned through this game in like a week or he had just started it over a week ago, but has managed to finish it as of uh, yesterday or the day before. And we won't spend a ton of time on this because we've already talked about this game at length. But I just do want to give Adam an opportunity to just voice his opinion on Stranger Paradise because I do know that he thought highly of uh, of Neo, which this game takes some inspirations from, even if it's not developed by the exact same team. So, Adam, I just wanted to give you a, a platform here to talk about your time with uh, Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin. Yeah, so I think I started it just after the podcast last week. It was either like Saturday night or Sunday morning. So I finished it in a week. It's not a very long game, uh, you know, relative to, you know, most Japanese. I mean, you, you, are, you are also a machine, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think yeah. I beat it like in. 30 hours and that's on hard mode i know you can beat it faster than that but oh yeah um, yeah like it took me like around 25 it def it's funny though because it's like most of the people i know that uh played stranger of paradise did it right after elden ring so it's like it's already shorter as far as like souls like skill and then you, you can pound it where it's like it's right after people have played what is by and far the longest one and it's just like man that's like a that was like a nice like crisp walk in the park a short 30 hours tiny <laughs> compared to the 100 hour elden ring right. but um so anyways uh i've been looking forward to this game because i i really like neo i know this isn't really like the neo team developing it it's the dissidia team who made dissidia and t um which maybe shouldn't have been like something to look forward to because that game was apparently problematic but um it seemed to share a lot in common with neo uh it's really seemed to have a high focus on the job system and the combat there are lots of jobs in this game felt like you know 30 jobs there's a lot um or maybe more but uh it, playing through the game i you know i probably didn't like it as much as neo but it's clearly not as like high budget of a of an effort um but it's still a really solid game i liked messing around with the different classes they all play pretty um the classes there's there's enough variation between them that many of them play pretty differently from each other there are a few that are similar but maybe have like a a certain gimmick like for example um like i know the berserker or i should maybe i should just go like uh, i think it's dark knight is basically like a great sword or axe wielding class, but they have an ability where they can do more damage at the expense of their own health, which is, you know, pretty typical for Dark Knights in the Final Fantasy series. But then there's lots of other like classes that use similar weapons. I think Paladin does and a few others like Void Knight. And they all have like a different gimmick in terms of what they can do. I forget which class has the Mighty Guard technique, which I actually kind of liked. The Brain, um, I think. Yeah. Which, you know, so that they... There's like nine different weapons and, you know, every weapon has its own like different abilities that you can do with them uh, in terms of, you know, great swords, axe, spears, dual swords, things like that. And so it was fun kind of messing around with the different classes and stuff. I never really tried the mage classes. I usually had um, once I got Sophia in my party, I, I set her to sage when I could. And I found that was that worked really well because she could do some healing. She could do some big attacks. That's probably the one place in where this game feels very different from uh, Neo is that you have... I know in Neo you can summon like an ally or whatever, um, but here you have those two persistent AI-controlled party members at all times, and they are honestly pretty effective uh, at, 
at doing you know some decent damage and just a big big change from the first demo of this game where they were useless yeah like i'm i'm a pretty patient person when i play like neo in games like this where i take my time and like like i i don't take a lot of risks i usually wait for like the very clear openings to attack and whatnot but here it's like while i'm doing that doing my normal gameplay of like kind of staying back and waiting for openings my two allies are just like going all in and doing a decent chunk of damage and break damage while (laughs) while i'm just like okay guys you guys are a little bit reckless but sure uh so you know they're like that that's that 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 makes the game like i played on hard mode i feel like a lot of people i know did and it's because of those allies it's they can do they can help you out a lot um where hard mode doesn't feel that you know hard because (laughs) because of those two guys um your allies and you you have four different allies you can choose from. You pick two of them, and they each have different classes you can pick. I mostly stuck with Sophia once I got her with Sage, and I think Jed, I kind of messed around with various classes of his. But uh, I'm sure they're all valuable and useful. Uh, the one thing about the game that's a little bit weirder is the like the level design. It's pretty linear, uh, which I know Neo in a sense is as well. But it's I, I feel like Neo it was easier for me to kind of realize where I am and where to go and where I've been and where I haven't been. Where in Stranger of Paradise, it's a little bit easier to get like lost and turned around in some of those levels. Uh, especially the, uh, I think it was the Dark Forest, the Final Fantasy IX oh, yeah. uh-huh. uh, uh, level. Each level is based off a different Final Fantasy game. And, you know, it's not bad. You know, I don't really mind if the level design is more linear or open, but there are just some places where... Um, like that, where I got a little bit confused about like where am I actually supposed to be going, and which which route is the main route and which route is the side route, um, and I just feel like Neo had a little bit was a little bit more you know well constructed where I could like tell how things connected and were put together in their levels, um, but anyways, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I I think Josh mentioned mentioned this last week or maybe the week before. No, it must have been last week. No, who was it? I think Josh might have mentioned this because you went on the podcast last week. You might have mentioned this uh, in one of our other chats where I actually have an appreciation for kind of how how um, tense and how or not tense, how terse like the dialogue is yeah. in terms of how the dialogue is given and how like how quick the cutscenes are. They're very efficient and they get to the point. And I feel like there's kind of a flavor to how this, how the scenes are put together that I actually kind of appreciate. Did you mention this? Was it two weeks ago? I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah, if you had yeah, a yeah it was. It was two weeks ago. Like when uh, Scott was on. Like I was. Like a. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like when, when Scott was on, uh, I mentioned it. I, I didn't remember if you had a chance to really play much before then, even because it's only it had only been out a day or two. But, um, but uh, yeah, I'm basically following up on your. Kind of thought there is i kind of appreciate how the dialogue is given in this game it's it's a little bit truncated a little bit short but um i think it works it, it almost feels like like almost like a classic rpg and like the nes snes era where dialogue is sometimes a little bit you know more to the point and and quicker rather than you know going into long you know sections of like character interaction or whatnot what, I, what i'm thinking of, of is like the anti-kingdom hearts i don't know <laughs> Maybe um, you get some character interaction, like as you're like going through the levels. Um, Josh actually mentioned a point when um, I believe this is in the Flying Fortress level where uh, I forget Jed does something kind of silly or says something kind of silly, and Jack's like, "Pay attention!" and Jed's like, "Sorry," and Jack kind of like lets his like lets his shield down for a bit and he's like sorry sorry I, i'm just like that i'm sorry <laughs> that's so uh, good <laughs> like it, it, it's almost like self-realization I, 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 like, I, sometimes I, he's a jerk but like, i like, the, I like the, uh, the briefness of the cutscenes is like tied to like the characterization of jack it's like he just he's not that kind of person to like really want to let things like dwindle or like drag out like it's just yeah. that's just part of his character and that's why i think it's so effective is because it it ties back into that main character yeah, I yeah, like, I, I really appreciated it that uh, in those sections where you can tell that it's like he knows he's an angry dude. He ha- he he knows he has anger management issues, and he he doesn't want people to take it the wrong way. It's not personal mm-hmm. most of the time. But yeah, he he seems to have like so this like you realize that he realizes like he has like 
you know, he's kind of like this self-reflection that he, that he shows sometimes that I think like he kind of realized the kind of attitude that he puts off and that it can be abrasive. And so like it shows, it shows a little bit of like cracks in his like facade, if you will. I don't, um, I don't know if this is possible, but like so it's somehow not spoiling it for people. What did you think of like how it ended? So like the actual like, plot like the the sequence of events from beginning to end in terms of in terms of like how this actually fits into final fantasy one like i don't care it's, it's like it's not super compelling to me in terms of like what actually happens and and whatnot um but it's it's creative and it's interesting and it's weird and i like the way it's told and it's a little bit different flavor than what you normally get out of like a final fantasy game mm-hmm. um in in a way so again, I'm not trying to like spoil anything, but it's uh it wasn't it was more interesting than good, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that. Yeah, it, it it's 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 creative, but it's like in terms of like does this make me like reevaluate like the story of Final Fantasy One to a significant significant degree? Not really. It's just kind of like an interesting take on it. So I'll leave it at that. Well, sometimes there's a lot of value in that on its own, just because like it is a sort of storytelling that you don't witness before. And it's like we all this we all have this idea of what a of what you know a stories that really compel us and like really are like the high watermarks for the series or for RPGs in general. And then like, you're saying like this game is not that, but it's something I wasn't expecting or something that was proposed a little bit differently, and therefore I appreciate it all the same uh, on on like a different level, almost like you're measuring it using a different piece of equipment or something like that. Also kind of funny that uh, amusing to me how the game like how the game incorporates this is going to sound weird, but how the game incorporates fist bumps into like some of its narrative, really like like uh, I don't know if symbolism is the right word, but, you know, in some, in, in some of the narrative moments, like how fist bumps are utilized, it, uh, it, it actually is somewhat effective. So I, I laughed my ass off during that one fight with the cut in. And it's just yeah. like, <laughs> it's like, man. <laughs> Any other final thoughts on uh, Stranger Paradise, Adam? It's probably my favorite game this year so far. Granted, I've not played like Elden Ring. I liked it. Didn't love it. Like, it's I, I liked it a lot. It's just like it doesn't. It's kind of like a more sh- like a, a tweaked, maybe slightly more shallow version of Neo, and with maybe lower budget, but otherwise really enjoyable. I was looking forward to it, and you know, I think it didn't let me down. Might have the coolest battle system this year so far. Mm-hmm. And we have one last game to talk about in these uh, early section of the podcast. And this one, I have to hand it over to Josh because I don't know what we're talking about here. I know it has something to do with Princess Connect. I hate April Fools, man. <laughs> Especially when April Fools uh, uh, comes in Japan, and you just know it's going to be a bad time because they're going to like announce all the things you've ever wanted and then the very next day next day they're like just kidding <laughs> sucker so you know april fools came and went today or not today this week um and you know something really cool happened for princess connect uh, for april fools in japan so i don't know about you guys but have you guys ever played auto chess no but uh, i know no. it got like really popular like two and a half years ago like Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's one of those like it's not really popular anymore outside of like you know some community obviously, but like it's not as mainstream or like talked about in the in the mainstream as much anymore. But I think I like auto chess because of the April Fool's joke that Princess Connect uh, did this year. So for this year, Sci Games for the Princess Connect Japan client. Um, they released a separate client, that, and this is actually pretty a pretty common practice for big uh, mobile game uh, developers, where they'll release a separate client just for April Fools that has a game on it, and it's like, and it's only going to be available either for twenty four hours or in this case a week. So, and it's like, and it's like so much effort for like a shit post, and it's like, why would you do this? They do that every fun. year, with, it, even like with. Uh... Grand Blue, they do yeah. like shit posts with uh, Grand Blue. There'll be like this event, and you wish it was true. Like there would be an event where the main character, you know, there's two genders for the main character, right? You could be yeah, Pizza yeah. or Grant, and there's the event where they meet up, and <laughs> it's like it's a hoax, guys. It's like, it's or, like man, I sure wish this happened. Or like I remember, like uh, Tales of the Rays got like a fighting game on April Fools. Like there's a Tales fighting game, honest to god, Tales fighting game inside that game. It's like April Fools. It's like okay, cool. 
Uh, it's a Japan thing. They did, it, did, it did, did, did it FF fourteen do a separate thing, or, or a similar thing where they had like a fighting game, like not mode, but like a, a, a video? Yeah, 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 it, yeah. One of one of the people I follow on Twitter made a very good uh, tweet where it's like it's almost April Fools, where we can learn what uh, genres uh, developers consider a joke. Hey, and remember, some of these are true. Like uh, Arika did a uh, fighting game EX later that uh, that. Uh, Started as April Fools, and then most famously, RGG Studio Yakuza Seven was initially <laughs> an April Fools joke. I was like, yeah. "What if Yakuza was RPG?" It's like, "Wow, that's really cool." It's like, "Okay," and then they, that, and then that became a real thing. I was like, "Wow, that's crazy." So maybe yeah. it's just a testing their markets, maybe. So in in this case, uh, the side games made Princess Connect Grand Masters, and it is uh, a separate client that you can download for free for a week, only available for a week, where it is an honest to god like team fight tactics reskin of Princess Connect, but it's like it's like tweaked in a way that's like it's more matches go by faster and it's actually like really fun. Like I actually learned how to play auto chess this week because of that game. Wow, maybe maybe there's a room for a game called Dragalia Lost. D- dude, I'm ar- I'm already platinum rank in this fucking stupid shit post game. <laughs> and, now, and is there, is there anything that persists from this? Like, do do they give you any incentive to like, hey, if you do well in this week long access to this auto chess, we'll get you something in the main game or nope. something like that? Nope. No. <laughs> um, that actually, kind of surprised me. In Grand Blue, there was a, a Tyco uh, was a spoof for April Fool's like three years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. And what they did was the audience lied to other players. Is like if you could get the master triple S rank or something like that, there is a rare item you can get from it if you can do it. And people tried so hard to get like a perfect, and they found they got nothing. They were trolled by the fan base. Nice. So yeah, this game actually has like live PvP against seven other people, just like auto chess in real time. And how auto chess works is essentially it's it's so much to go over. I'm not gonna go into like the the you know, the whole minutia of it, but it has like the same type of like, okay, it's like a hex grid based type of deal where you place units and then you can level up to place more units and then you can like uh, buy units all, all with in-game currency that you make to, like through, through your economy in the game, kind of like, you know, how uh, MOBAs do it where you kind of like have to build up your economy per game. Um, and so like you can like match characters to like rank them up and then uh, think about like oh each character has like a job a, a job type and like uh, like a weapon type and like you ma- you match up like these synergies like to like gain uh, bonuses uh, to your lineups. You're like thinking about like formations on the fly of how you want to build your team because uh, for some for some phases you'll like uh, fight against monsters and then like another phase you'll fight against like a person and like uh, in real time. But you're not like controlling the characters in real time. You kind of it's just all how you position them and then the actual combat itself is played out automatically and then you know uh depending on whether you win or lose like an encounter like a person will take hp damage and then once they their damage goes to zero they're out of that match uh and so forth so it's actually like really in depth this has like over 60 princess connect uh, connect characters in it which is almost the whole roster and they're all unique 3d models just for this game all unique animations uh you know and then like there are like unique like as like stickers like animated stickers for leader types um that it's like all just made for this game it's like ridiculously high effort and i'm just like oh my god i hate you guys because i I want this to be like a permanent thing now because i know when they shut this down i'm gonna be really mad i even told myself uh, like when i when i was first watching my friend play this for the first time and I didn't even download it. I'm like, like I don't want to download this because I know if I download this, I'm gonna get hooked, and then a week later, I'm gonna get fucking pissed that like it's gone forever because I'm having like an absolute blast with it right now, like learning, uh, learning it, and like thinking of like item, co- uh, like putting items on characters, and thinking about how like how characters synergize with one another, and like what are what are like the good characters that I like want to uh, put in my lineup, and uh, learning like different strategies, so. I don't know. And my friend's like, you can always just play Team Fight Tactics. I'm like, I know, but it's not Princess Connect characters. <laughs> so like I like, said, there's always room for Dragalia Lost. They will yeah. die and they become auto chess. Dude, they put a battle royale mode in Dragalia Lost, not even as like as a April Fools, but like as a permanent mode, and like that didn't really take off. It's because they didn't know what to do with the games. Yeah, they well, tried. These these guys yeah. probably do. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, it's uh, got Josh Hook, so they definitely know what they're doing. Yeah, and yeah, I don't, I don't understand why this game, like this uh, April Fool's joke, is so good. So I, that's just my little uh, corner of like, man, I, I got into auto chess in the year 2022, and my gateway drug my was Princess Connect. Terrible, terrible. Well, that pretty much covers us for games we've been playing, including uh, April Fool's shit post games. Uh, a couple of the features that are up on the site that we put off because other people had contributed them to rpgsite.net. One of them is, surprise, Alex is still apparently playing Elden Ring, as I'm sure several uh, readers and listeners are still doing, and Adam will get to eventually. So Alex put up a uh, an op-ed essentially talking about how he's played Elden Ring three times. Once uh, as his first playthrough, once as a New Game Plus playthrough, and then once as a... Uh, as a fresh file, not on New Game Plus, using a, a different sort of build, and how he's basically, even though the game is massive, and even though the game has tons of secrets that have been kind of over the last month thoroughly kind of analyzed and determined, and people know the optimal route of how to complete these side quests and what the you know what the rewards are depending on the choices you make and things like that. All the stuff when the game released about keeping a notebook about where NPCs are and you know what you should do with each of them. That's all you know. It's all been figured out. It's all up on the wikis and things like that. How he's found continued enjoyment of the game, uh, playing through as a fresh file. So that's up on the site if you want to hear about more uh, more opinions on Elden Ring. Apparently, it's a game that I expect that Alex will be badly, uh, batting you know very strongly for when it comes to the end of the year, as I'm sure many of us will be. But he is keeping it uh, in the vogue, in the know for uh, the month of April. Still, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna need game. more time. Yeah, I'm gonna need more time for a second playthrough because that game is very exhausting, uh, even That's... on a first playthrough. Yeah, because I didn't even get the um the platinum, like all the different uh, endings that you can get and the variations. I got my one ending. And I'm like, all right, I'll just put this down for a few months and I'll, I'll get back to it uh, at some yeah. point. But too many other games on the backlog for me to go through three three spins of the wheel in that one. And the other uh, pair of features up on the site, this is a game that Chow was able to talk uh, briefly about on the last podcast, and that is the uh, the English release of Rune Factory 5. Obviously, uh, this released last year. Chow talked about it then. It released uh, in Japan, I mean, and then it released in English in late March, and Chow was able to revisit it uh, and talk about that release. What we have up on the site now are two sets of interviews where we got some of the developers able to answer some questions about uh, the game and its localization. We have two features up on the site. One of which is from the director Shiro Makawa talking about uh, the romance influences with the future of the series, kind of a more of a high level approach to what Rune Factory is and what it can be and the series future. And then we have a separate set of questions and answers up on the site, specifically about the localization team and the approach that they had and the freedom that they had about how they brought the game over for the English speaking audience. So just kind of it's really cool when we're able to get some candid answers from the development team, both in terms of the original uh, director as well as the localization team for the English release. So if you're playing Rune Factory 5 and you just wanted to see some more insight about how, how it came to be, we have both of those features up on the site. So Andrea was able to put together those questions and answers for us. And it's just kind of a, oh, and Paige assisted as well. So those are uh, just some behind the scenes looks for how those games came to be. So give those uh, a look over if you're interested. And I believe that covers us for features. Uh, I do want to shout out, though, that in addition to those interview pieces, we also have been putting up several uh, guides that Andrea and uh, others have been contributing to for for that game. So if you're currently playing through those, we also probably have some features up on the site that might help you along. All right. In terms of news, like I kind of mentioned at the outset of this podcast, I wasn't exactly sure which of these should be you know the headline news that we should start out with because there's a few that easily could have been. So I semi arbitrarily picked this one because I feel like surprisingly, at least from my perspective, it seemed to go under the radar, and that was the announcement of. One Piece Odyssey. This is an RPG from Nam uh, Bandai Namco. I still want to say Namco Bandai. Bandai Namco, uh, developed by Ilka, that is releasing later this year for PlayStation consoles, Xbox consoles, and PC. And it is featuring an original story featuring, the obviously, the cast and world of One Piece. So are we excited about this, or do we think that it's going to just be another mediocre anime adaptation 
I'm going for the mediocre adaptation. Oh, so developer, I, I don't know. Like, like Ilka's worked on Dragon Quest a lot. That's why, I, but that's also the reason why maybe it won't bomb because the, 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 one of the screenshots looks like fucking Dragon Quest Eleven. Yeah, just it looks like you know it's turn based. It's no, yeah, and, and, it's yeah. just I never had a good experience with anything that's based on a manga. You know, that's kind of like Chow, Chow is. Uh, Still reeling from uh, the fairy tale RPG. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I I will give a caveat, and I I'll be the first to admit here. I've I've never watched One Piece. I've never read One Piece. I gave up after like eighty chapters. I just think Dragon Ball is way superior. I, I, <laughs> so like, I, I, I know One Piece fans will come after. It's like, dude, it's crazy good every week, and it's like, I, oh yeah. no, they're gonna I kill me a, for saying that. I have that. a bunch of followers or mutuals that just post that. One piece was really good this yeah, week. Yeah, it was crazy good this week. Yep. <laughs> Same here. Uh yeah, I don't know. I mean, One Piece seems cool, but I never really I never really got into the property. So I mean I I don't know what to expect, you know. Should is is this the way the way to experience One Piece is through a JRPG original story? Yeah, the, the, you know, that, the thing that I think is probably that working against it is that a lot of people like One Piece because of like the story and like how like how well it connects like from you know for thousands of episodes and chapters or whatever uh you know but the fact that this is like kind of detached from all of that and like a separate standalone non-canon thing like you're basically i guess then focusing on like the characters and their abilities now so i i think though that's the only like part of me was kind of i've i've seen the first few arcs of one piece not like only like before the time skip which was like years and years ago at this point it's i'm not even trying to think to say that's even recent stuff anymore this is like ancient stuff but i that would have been obviously way too much for a game to like approach it was like this is how you experience the story of one piece because obviously that would have been like yeah like a massive if you did something like a dragon ball z kakarot game only for one piece to go through the actual storyline would be like massive, and Dragon Ball Z it either it either be massive or it'd have to like just really Water like down thin it out. It'd be a yeah. game as a service. You'll get a weekly up story updates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, like I think, like the for me, the thing that caught me off guard was like, oh, it's another game that Sagaraba is composing. Uh, yeah, he's already Sagaraba's on it. Yeah, he's he's working on Star Ocean. He's working on Valkyrie Elysium, and now this game. That dude is a machine this year. And, and just the age, from the uh, previously worked on Tales of Arise, and from the mm-hmm. press release, we talked about the original story. This is the wording from the uh, publisher. During their voyage, the Straw Hats, led by Monkey D. Luffy, are swallowed by a huge storm at sea. They end up on a mysterious island full of nature amidst the storm and become separated. The crew sets out on a new adventurous journey filled with wonders of a raging nature, powerful enemies, strange encounters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it feels almost kind of like the very. It's all, like not only is it a self-contained story, like narratively but it all takes place like on this island so like even like physically in the world it's like convenient way to to have it kind of like fenced off and they're like don't worry this is a standalone it can be slotted in x many places probably uh the designs are post time skip design so in that region of the of the narrative which i can't speak to because i've never witnessed or read or watched one piece in that era but i don't know maybe this is something for the more casual fan rather than someone who wants something that's really more uh like the Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, which even then, I mean, has... yeah, I mean, One Piece has like gotten like its fair share of action games. Like, yeah, the One Piece Musou games, you know, that have like there's like what three or four mm-hmm. of them at this point, and it's like it's cool that like they're going for a genre shift and going for a more turn based approach and seeing. I wonder how that'll manifest. You know, if there's something like if there's a hook to it that'll make it stand out from other turn based shad- or turn based RPGs. I do like how the announcement trailer absolutely has no indication of how the game plays. It's. I mean, yeah. I, I forget where, but I, uh, there's like some YouTube description somewhere says turn based, but you have to like seek it out. Yeah, to, like, most confirm, of the most sure. of the announcement trailer is just Luffy running around environments, uh, the, the like montages of the different characters doing like character specific things, and it really does look like Dragon Quest in a lot of ways, <laughs> like the enemy design and uh, just the art style in general. But hey, I thought well, several of us thought the Dragon Quest Eleven was amazing. Now. This is being developed by Ilka, which only supported Dragon Quest XI, so we don't know how much of that pedigree will transfer over, but I don't know. I think this looks interesting. We don't have a time period other than this year at some point, 2022, so we'll have some you know, more. I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of this game in regular updates from this point forward, because it's not too far out. 
Speaking of things that are not slated for 2022, uh, one of the, the, I think some people might have seen this coming or might have been wishful thinking, and that is the sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild has been officially delayed to spring 2023. So, of course, my immediate take is we can once again put this on our RPG site <laughs> most anticipated list. <laughs> Jesus, I did, I'm trying to find another description of like, all right, yet another year where this is here and we're all still very excited about it. And what's been shared so far is uh, long-haired Ling. I don't yep. know. So yeah, there's not a lot of other details announcing or accompanying this footage, or this announcement, it, other than a slight bit of footage showing Obviously, the another look at the new design of Link holding a very dilapidated-looking Master Sword of some sort. And hey, you know what? Long-haired Link, short hair, Aonuma. That yeah, dude yeah. got a haircut. He looks, uh, he looks good. Hi, you know, it's, yeah, it's high, fresh. He's the, high and he's tight. Good. So that that was the that was the big reveal actually of this uh, delayed news is Aonuma got a haircut. <laughs> We are, we're all like, as 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 you know, the pandemic seems to slowly be kind of winding down, or at least in the denouement, we're all getting our haircuts again. And uh, I don't know, I was trying to tie those things together. Maybe that wasn't very good. <laughs> I, I remember when the sequel was announced in 2019 that, like, you know, people just sort of made the assumption it, it'll be out relatively soon if they started oh. it after development of the original because they have like all the assets in place, right? And now it's like, Nope. Guess not. No. <laughs> yeah. The original came out what five years ago now. So hey, you know what? Spring twenty twenty three, just another time frame for a potential new switch. Model. Yeah, I've I've already Upgrade seen people model. speculating. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh they delayed it so they can launch it alongside a new version of the Switch. Yeah. Which you know again. like the only thing that might support that is just the timing, like six years, maybe. Okay, but but, but doesn't doesn't account for like the very real problems in the supply chain for like <laughs> chip, chip, chip chips and whatnot. So, uh, you know, who knows? Who oh, knows? Just another. It's it's fine. You know, I've I've I, look. Take as much time as you need. If this this fucking game come out in twenty twenty six, and I can uh, I wouldn't care. You know, it's like as long as like it comes out and it's like pretty damn good. So, good luck. Do and, do you uh, think before the end of the year, we'll have an official title? Uh, we already do. It's called the sequel to the Legend of Zelda: oh. Breath of the Wild. <laughs> That's the official title. That's I'm thinking, no, with. we won't. For, I'm thinking like Nintendo seems to like to do this thing sometimes, where well, maybe that's rich to say when this game has been known and in development for so long, where they they announce things and then quickly turn around and it's released and available. Obviously that's not the case here, but I do kind of, I wouldn't be surprised if they have like a Nintendo direct in early 2023 where they announce the the actual date other than just spring, like March, whenever. And then I'd have to assume, I'd have to assume like it has to be either like December or I guess like this, this thing needs to have like an entry in like retails, uh, like right. retail back then. Right. So I, I think know, they'll do. Right? I think it won't be a drip feed. I think it'll be a big blowout in an early 2023 Nintendo Direct with a release date, yeah. if not soon thereafter. Like big blowout. By the way, you're playing this game in two weeks, something like they that. They do. They do. They do like their their early year, early year of like big announcement. Stuff. So mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe you're right. So I'll uh, take it off the most anticipated list for this year, and we'll put it back on for next year. As cross it out. On, on the, uh, yeah, you cross that out of our 2021 or 2022 anticipated, and like. Like, all right, just scribble something here, delayed or something. <laughs> Editor's note. We also got an announcement for the third entry in the Prinny Presents NIS Classic series. So obviously we had the first entry a couple of years back. The second entry is releasing later this year that contains uh, Makai Kingdom and ZHP, at least in English. And now we have an announcement of Prinny, Prinny Presents NIS Classics Volume 3. The two games in this set are La Pucelle Ragnarok and Rhapsody, A Musical Adventure. So, of course, I'm obligated to ask, does anyone here have like personal history with either of these two games? I played La Pucelle uh, on the PS2. Yeah, so that, that's the weird thing. La Pucelle Ragnarok, that's specifically that version, never got localized. It's, it's the PSP version of La Pucelle Tactics, but it's the, the there's like new content in it, so there's like 
new artwork, uh, new Disgaea crossover uh, characters. Wow. There's like new a- new endings. There's like actual like real content added to it. But that but that biggest, never got. I think the own. biggest change for that one there was a new game plus feature. Yeah, there's a new game plus mode. In the- um, there was this one thing that I hate with the original game was that there was these like super. Was it like some bonus objective? But they have like these like level one hundred enemies in like a level ten zone, and you're like, how the hell am I supposed to do that? And I couldn't figure it out. And well, maybe now I don't have to figure it out. I could just new game plus it. Right? Yeah, um, I know. I know Makai Kingdom that's in the upcoming second uh, collection is similar. Yes, in that it includes like the it includes PSP content for the PSP version of Makai Kingdom that was never localized. So at the very least. Uh, NIS putting together these collections. First of all, it's just you know putting them on Steam and Switch is just good for preservation purposes. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah, but yeah, also I, it's I, like I the opportunity to like re- to include these like most recent versions finally. Yeah, um, I never specified that this is a uh, PC um, and Switch. Yeah, all these collections are like there. There's three collections now, or there's going to be three collections. The only the first one's out. The second one comes out this month. Um, it's like a collection on Switch, but then they also just get standard like Steam releases. It seems like I know, like in terms of the uh, like, they're not really remasters in terms of like the graphical style of these games. It, they're they're still pretty, you know. It looks like an upscaled PSP game on Steam or whatever, which you know is fine. They just that's just the kind of collection these are, which is you know it's better than nothing. But they're not really like like redrawn remasters or anything like that. Yeah. So honestly, they're, they're like if, the, if, the, if the budget right. is like, if the budget allocation is like, Hey, if you want to focus, do we either want to focus on like visuals or do we want to focus on like bringing content over, like, like to make it the definitive collection, I would t- easily take the latter over mm-hmm. just like, you know, a, a touch up on the visuals because, you know, I like, when you think about like definitive releases, I actually want to, that it to feel like that. And that, that's, this is the way to do it. It's like, Hey, this content never got brought over lo- overseas, and this is like uh, another second chance to like you know rebring these over and like not have it accessible for everyone. So that's but like really, I that's I, I do want to eventually like get around to like playing things like Soul Nomad, which is coming out soon. Mm-hmm. And I un- like I, I'm going in with the like, understanding that like when I if I buy still Soul Nomad on Steam and play it, it's going to look like a PSP game. So that yeah. that but that's fine with me, you know. Yeah. So that so like yeah, Lapis Cell Ragnarok uh, is definitely one one uh, piece of the puzzle here. Like Rhapsody, a musical adventure, is like another thing in itself. Like because it, it, it's weird inherently because it was originally a PlayStation One game, and then it got like a remake on Nintendo DS that really uh, changed up like how the way it plays. So like on the PlayStation One, this was more of like an isometric strategy RPG s game where like you had like actual like grids in combat like move around and stuff and in the nintendo ds version of that it was a more of like a a 2d turn-based game that like you had like enemies on one side and like the your characters on the other side and it wasn't isometric they were just like facing at each other to accommodate for the ds limitations and you know to accommodate that 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 tech and the screen and everything so and then this one, uh, this upcoming re-release, they're they're uh, it's based off of the original PlayStation One version uh, of that game. And I know a lot of people really like the dub <laughs> of uh, Rhapsody Musical Adventure because there's like actual like you know musicals in it. Um, and sadly, it's it's looking like from the Steam pages of both of these games that only the Japanese audio uh, is uh, being brought over for this. Uh, Penny presents. Do they collection. know if they were they originally in English or dubbed? Well, the thing uh, is, the, the text, the PS One version was, but it was not. It wasn't NAS America at that time because it didn't yeah. exist yet. It was someone else, so that might. Oh, like legal. I, I, don't, I never played the original, but I always hear like terrible things about that game, and they didn't like really make a big name on the West until the Sky came out. That's what I remember. I, just, I bet, 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 bet a lot of people like you know just back then like play, when you think about PlayStation One like uh, like. The speed of PlayStation, like people, like it never like stellar like English does, but they were fun, you know. Like it was something like you know, it always made, it made you smile. It's like okay, this game's trying something. Wow, uh, it's like House of the Dead, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, that that is suffer that like G so did. Cool. Like, fuck yeah. Like okay. correction, I said Soul Nomad looked like a PSP game. It looks it looked like a PS2 game. It wasn't on PSP. No, and sorry. 
<laughs> so yeah, I mean that this is uh this is really cool. I I'm glad that this uh, pretty present series has you know it's been really working out for them. Uh, I'm always more power to like re-releasing like old PS1, PS2 RPGs to like a modern audience because th- those are not easy to come by anymore and easy to play. You know, so oh, yeah. So the original Rhapsody was published by Atlas. Way there you way. go. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, that is I mean, done. Atlas did a lot of like this niche stuff before. You know, Persona and SMT. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and it is a good glimpse of like, hey, this did, did things before Disgaea, the first Disgaea. I know a lot of people associate with Disgaea, but they were trying out mm-hmm. some stuff before mm-hmm. Disgaea really uh, hit it off. For them. That's cool. I honestly don't know if you were doing this intentionally, but I'm going to use that topic that you were talking about, play, uh, getting PlayStation 1 and 2 games playable, to segue into our next topic. And that is about the new combination service of... PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now. So obviously this isn't specific to RPGs, but it's, you know, it hits pretty much anyone that plays on Sony consoles in which a lot of RPG developers, JRPG specifically, have kind of called their home for a long while now. And that is the introduction of the new three-tiered PlayStation Plus service, which incorporates PlayStation Now. And let me just kind of go over this at a high level, and then we'll talk about kind of how we feel about it. So PlayStation Plus as it is known now is playstation plus essential this is the the free downloadable games each month the online play and things like that no change to price no change to any other things like that it is just now the essential tier of playstation plus the second tier is playstation plus extra which obviously includes the online play and the game collection from the 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 monthly game downloads from the essential tier plus a catalog of 400 downloadable titles from the ps4 and ps5 era and then the final the tier oh yeah, that, the uh, that is 50 percent more so the the essential tier is ten dollars a month or sixty dollars a year and the extra tier is fifteen dollars a month or a hundred dollars a year and then the f- highest tier is playstation plus premium so this includes the online play and monthly titles from the essential tier the titles from the playstation 4 and 5 era from the extra tier and then a catalog of PlayStation 3 games available via streaming, as well as PlayStation, PlayStation 2, and PlayStation Portable games available by streaming or download. So a catalog of historical PlayStation games by either download or streaming, with a specific note that all PlayStation 3 games are streaming only. There's a few other like side notes for like what this tier is shifted in areas that don't have access to uh, PlayStation Now. They only get the downloadable options, things like that, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the main thing is, is that this is $18 a month or $120 yearly, so a little bit higher than obviously the um, the extra tier. So, and this is going to be a combination of PlayStation Now, so that service will be folded into PlayStation Plus. I don't know if they specified, like, people who have, like, outgoing months, like people who have paid months in advance for those services, how they'll be incorporated into this new tiered system. So, when I first heard of, I don't play a ton on Sony consoles. I think the only thing I played on the PlayStation 5 so far is uh, the UP DLC still. Uh, so when I first heard about this, my take was, this sounds pretty good. I don't know. This seems smart. It seems like a Game Pass competitor. It seems like it's pretty comprehensive. The A few caveats, like such as the PS3 games being streaming only, I think is understandable based on how that system's architecture worked. But uh, I've noticed that other people maybe that play more on these consoles or have been looking more forward to this seem a little bit lukewarm on this. And I'm not 100% sure why. So I'm not sure if anyone here can explain like what their takes are on this service uh, and how you're feeling about what's what's being offered here. Oh, I feel pretty lukewarm about it as well. Uh, I don't just feel lukewarm. I feel kind of pissed off. But let me get to that. <laughs> um, so... <sighs> On the surface, the uh, service isn't terrible. But then there's two things to consider. If you actually take the numbers that Sony has provided and then compare them to the current PlayStation Now like number of available games, there's a discrepancy. Not every game that's available in PlayStation Now, but to the tune of a couple hundred, is going to be available in this new service once they combine. So that's one thing. Second, and I'm 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 well aware that the actual like population that is doing this is going to be incredibly small, but 
the way that they're selling this is like it's a new service, but what they're actually doing is they're combining PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now. And there is no longer a way for folks that maybe just want PlayStation Now, like they don't care about online multiplayer or any of that, to just buy PlayStation Now separately. That is a good point. Well, I know like I personally only would only really care about like the the classic games library. And in order for me to get that, like, oh, I need to buy the the most the second advanced tier, gear, which includes, oh, no, yeah. you know, if you want the uh, PS2 games, yeah, you want the you, you definitely need, yeah, which includes, you know, like yeah. the, the free PlayStation Plus games and whatnot. Like, I don't care about that too much. I just want, yeah. you know, I, I'd be more interested in the classic stuff, but, you know, you have to yeah. get the most advanced tier for that. And finally, and I think this is the most important part, is we got to talk about the elephant in the room. This isn't like even selling themselves say that they're not deliberately trying to target game pass but the problem is is that that comparison is going to be made and as of right now (laughs) yeah and as of right now it looks like none of your purchases from the ps3 generation for playstation 1 or playstation 2 games is going to come forward it does not look like there's going to be any way to play those ps1 ps2 and psp classics without paying for the sub, even if you own those games already digitally on PSN. And you can say, well, Game Pass is a thing, and it's all a subscription service. But the thing is, and that this is one thing that Microsoft has been really good about, is that they've been clear that they don't want Game Pass to be the only way to play any of their games. If you want to buy an original Xbox or a 360 game, you can just buy it. You can use your original disc if you have an Xbox that has a disc drive. But with the PS5, there's no way to do that. Not to mention the whole thing where it's like, everyone knows that Sony could get a number of PS3 titles working on PS5 if they invest in actual emulation. But they're not going to do that, so everyone's going to have to suffer with streaming lag. And it's just... I don't know. The whole thing feels like Sony desperately trying to have a counter to the narrative that Game Pass is setting. But if you look below the surface, it's like, no, it's if anything, this is worse than how it was when PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now was separate. The only thing we're getting now is we're getting like direct access to PlayStation 1 and PSP games where it seems like there's going to be no way to just buy them, let alone if folks already own them, they won't be able to just randomly, they won't just be able to bring those purchases forward. Whereas that's not the case on on um, on uh, Xbox consoles. And granted, you can say the same thing about everything with the Switch, but that's also like way cheaper than what Sony is going to be charging. I, I want to ask an obvious question just to make sure this is correct. There is no game in the Xbox digital ecosystem that you have to have Game Pass to play because you can just buy it if you want. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. That, that's actually, I think, the the point that I did not consider that if you want to play, we don't like we don't know what these titles are. We can kind of glean it based on probably the current PlayStation Now catalog, at least for the um uh, the, the, there's titles. no there's no game pass exclusive titles because i'm thinking of like stuff like the xbox series of octopath as can you buy octopath separately from like outside of having game pass yes okay because yeah i'm just i'm just trying to make sure it's like were there any game pass exclusives can I yes say? yes yeah. so this is why when you guys were asking you know was anybody actually upset about this it's like yeah, yeah I there's, kind there's, of definitely am. A lot. there's definitely a lot of people who like especially when you lay it out like that it, it makes a lot of sense uh, were you going to say something, Chow? I was going to say, um, remember that Persona being Persona Five being removed from their PS Plus catalog? It's like, are they going to put this into their new service, trying to get people more enticed to to try out the system or something? Uh, who knows? Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. They're going to like uh, they're going to remove that like what next month or something? It was it was it was that was recent news, but I don't, I don't remember off the top off top of my head. But yeah, like. It, Definitely, I agree a lot with what James is saying. That like uh, right now, the, a lot of the language feels like too much of this is gated by premium. Hopefully, they provide clarification, you know, one way or the other, um, before the service releases on like exactly how this is all going to be separated. Because like the initial language doesn't lend them 
isn't doing them any favors. It also doesn't like. I'm really interested to see like what the catalog even looks like in the first place too. Like the like, the, like me personally, do I even care? Like because a lot of this stuff is like very easily obtainable one way or the other. Um, if you decide to so because I because like I it feels bad to, to support Sony. <laughs> like if I want to play like say I want to play Stella Deus for my P- from the PS2. Wow, now that's a classic. Ah, right? uh, there you go. You know, and like the, I don't want to fucking play eighteen dollars a fucking month to uh, play Stella the, for the option to play Stella Stella Deus, and hopefully I can download that because they yeah, haven't even made it. I mean, they haven't even made made it clear, like like uh, unlike these older ones, because they said I don't know if, if, if I'm I'm fear that like some of these games are only going to be streamed, and only a few of these games are going to allow for both streaming and download. They haven't really made it clear that's going to be available for each and every single one. You know, and there's and and like you said, PS3 games being locked behind cloud streaming already fucking sucks. Like I get like the architectural challenges behind doing that, but for Christ's sakes, you're fucking Sony, you know? Yeah, yeah, and and you know that that Zen 2 CPU can run a decent number of PS3 games. It's like yeah. sure, not all of them might be able to run, but. That's for what cloud streaming is for. That you should really get cloud streaming to that to those the yeah. ones that are difficult to run. And you know what? You know what? I'm gonna say it. Xbox supports dev mode, and there is an Xbox RetroArch port. Yeah. So, like, if you already own like plenty of PlayStation One, PS2, how heck, even PSP games that you maybe you've made backups of in your own time, you can just play them on Xbox, and you don't have to. And because it's your own dumps, it's like. You don't have to pay a monthly fee. It's like Microsoft officially supports people using dev mode and they are fine with people do, uh, using RetroArch on their system if they're doing it through dev mode. Sony is basically forcing you to pay an additional fee on top to play games that as of right now you might already own, but they don't care. And that yeah, just like feels the- incredibly scummy. Yeah, just uh, it, it feels bad. Like, hey, I have a PS5 with a disc drive here. I have a lot of PS2 games on my shelf, and it just feels really, uh, really awful. It's like, oh, like even if they support like this, like it, it feels like at the moment, at the current uh, the the language right now supports like, oh, those this won't work even if you're not sub to this premium. If that if that's even how that if that's how it even works, like you know, if that's if there's any way these uh, these things will interface with the this, which I support, I. I I'm thinking it, it, it doesn't suggest it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'll be clear. If they let people use their like PS2 discs to play PS2 games, great. Can't use PlayStation 1 discs because the PS5 does not have a CD laser, um, which is a dumb decision that I would <laughs> regardless. But uh, yeah, I will jab my PSP UMDs in this PS5 one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this, this might have been obvious, but also. Vita is not mentioned anywhere in any of this. Yeah, just I mean, maybe or that's Vita. obvious with the way it has like the touch back screen and things like that. Because I know that's, some a, of that, that, that's a flimsy excuse for it. It's just it, uh, Vita, Vita always gets done dirty by Sony because they never want to acknowledge it. Hmm. Oh, I think Sony has good intentions back then, but they just always miss the mark every time because it's like if they didn't have those memory cards, overpriced memory cards, and just sold SD cards and just trust their audience somewhat i think that system would have been successful yeah there's there's some other things i'd like to talk about with sony but now's not the place maybe i'll talk yeah. after we're done with the podcast but yeah yeah it, it, it just feels like i don't know it just feels it just feels weird right now especially you know jim Ryan doesn't have like the greatest reputation okay. on his, I, uh, I, i've been on the record <laughs> you know i'll say this since i've already been on the record there are legitimate concerns about how sony has a double standard when it comes to how they police uh, western and japanese content on their platform and yeah. it's 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 a lot yeah definitely and, you know and, and i guess like the, the the final thing worth mentioning here is like it's also not going to be Game Pass in the way that like there a lot of their newer releases won't be coming day and date with this service. You know, it's not like a day one release, like how uh, uh, Microsoft handles it on Game Pass for uh, a select number of titles. Like Starfield, for example, will be available mm-hmm. on Game Pass on day one. Well, ostensibly any uh, Microsoft published title. Yeah. So I'm just giving an uh, example. 
Well, now now I feel kind of sour. Like, oh, I thought this seemed kind of nice, but you all brought yeah, up it, legitimate, it, it, yeah, legitimate yeah, points. Yeah, yeah it, it, it sounds really nice on the surface. I, I, I well, I what I, the way you, when you were talking about playing what Stella dies or whatever, <laughs> um, like for instance, if I wanted to play because I don't own these on PSN because I didn't have a PS3 or whatever, um, right. if I wanted to play like the Suikoden entitles, and let's say they're part of this collection, it'd be like, all right pay 18 bucks a month and then have access to maybe some classic suikoden in titles uh for as long as i have the subscription if i wanted to play those before uh aiden chronicles 100 heroes but only for as long as i had the sub and then like okay i guess i guess i finally got these played time to uh unsub i guess and hopefully i don't feel like revisiting those because i assume you lose access i don't know i just seem now that the more i think about it in practice i'm like that does seem not really much not really convenient unless you are like a sony mono gamer like everything I mean, plays and, and, on yeah, sony and that, in that respect that's like that that's the same way too like hey you only get gain access to game pass titles uh, uh like uh, as far as larger stuff but 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 like the main distinguisher there is you can buy those games separately should you can right. want to continue to not continue. to mention not to mention this is a, is something that people don't really talk about any game that's on game pass you can buy for 20 percent off that's true yeah Mm-hmm. Well, uh, well, we'll see if they shift tact or how. I mean, I'm, sh- I don't know if it. I'm sure that they've got enough of a footprint where this will be a good, you know, current subscribers of PlayStation Now and PS Plus. I think this really only benefits them. Because... We can only hope. We can only hope that uh, that Sony gets bullied into revising some of this because it seems to work. Uh, oddly enough, because like of how. They were bullied with the Horizon uh, yep. scenario, and like there's like another thing where like they were bullied enough to like address it and like okay, we'll do better. <laughs> so well, who knows? I don't think, I don't think that seems, the whole paradigm like... will be shifted, but it would be interesting if maybe they alter like a split based tier, like how Adam wants, where it's like you get the you get the catalog, but not not the online play or something. I don't know. Right. I'm trying to think like yeah. what's reasonable versus what's like ideal. Oh, and maybe maybe yeah. they have some low an alternative lower tier where it's like all right this well, gives you access to the catalog at something that's less than 18 bucks a month or something like in, that in, in, in this case a uh, bullying uh, the sony megacorp has worked historically so we'll see if we can do it again all right and the last major piece of news from this week is as is every like I don't know, every two months or so, we had another uh, Final Fantasy XIV live letter describing the first major post-expansion update following the Endwalker expansion. So this is patch 6.1 titled Newfound Adventure. And I do like how when Adam wrote this post up, he kind of cheekily put in the blurb that anyone that plays Final Fantasy XIV probably doesn't need us to relay kind of what this uh what this patch so contains because you've probably already gone to your to your wiki or your mog station or wherever like this post information gets like cataloged uh for posterity but I'm, i am still kind of interested to hear the two people here that play final fantasy 14 that is uh james and chow kind of i just just by curiosity what are we looking forward to in a post and walker world with patch 6.1 i'll hand it off to uh to james first what uh, what are we looking forward to on april 12th with newfound adventure ishgard housing wow. is that it ishgard <laughs> that housing. So- he wants that house okay the housing is the hardest thing yeah the housing work. market is pretty intense in ff14 yeah people would stay up 24 7 to make sure they can thankfully thankfully that's no longer the case because it's all a lottery system which is good but it's uh, but it's also like uh, gonna put my bet down. Well, not bet. I'm gonna put my uh, lot down and hope I get pulled for a medium plot house in uh, the Yashgard Housing District. Oh, it's not competitive, man. That 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 that's taking out the skill. I, I, I there should, uh, should be a there should be a merit based uh, decision. Oh, thank God, I don't have to worry about that thing because I am too poor to even put the down payment in this. Game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here's the thing with me, Chow. Yeah, I'm bad. I'm down bad because I already saved up around 11 million gil, so I still need at least five million before I can put the down payment down. But the thing is, is that since I did all of the shared fates for uh, N Walker. I can do the bicolor gemstone voucher ma- um, method because guess what? 
Nobody else wants to do it. And each of those vouchers is going for over 100K gil on the market board. Jeez. See, Rich Chad people, I tell you. Rich you got to have enough brain rot to do that, Chow. Come <laughs> on now. But the, I, the, the one thing I, I saw from friends about this upcoming thing is they're rerunning the Garo collaboration costumes, and they're all very happy about that because oh, yeah. a lot, a lot yeah, of people were, are. were very scared. They were, they were gonna, never going to be able to get the Garo costumes again. Not to mention the mounts, which are pretty good. Yeah, I, I'm excited to check that out. Like Those Garo mounts are definitely some of the coolest looking things in the game. So yeah then, then, then since you joined, joined a little too late you missed that out, out the first time around so if i remember they were part of the pvp yeah well reward, you know the right? funny thing is is that i did not actually join too late i just did not start playing again until like I, if i had known that the Garo stuff was going away and i was like like at the time i could have grinded it out when i got oh. back to it because i started right before patch 5.2 launch because it was it was through patch 5.1 i want to say Something like that. Either way, it doesn't matter now because it's coming back. And who knows? Maybe it'll be permanent this time. Even if it's not, I'll be able to get mine. So I don't really yeah. care. Hell yeah. So I'm going to ask an obvious question, but I assume that this also continues the story, which my understanding is, is that for all the other expansions, the post, you know, the point one, point two, point three launches would round out the story of the expansion. But that wasn't the case for Endwalker, which had finality and closure so this is basically the start of a new story arc isn't that correct the complete yeah. in fact the uh, name of the patch itself is right. uh, a newfound adventure so but yeah. we don't really have a whole idea what's going on they're just exploring a new continent that's all we know basically yeah the only the interesting thing is that we did see a bit of the dungeon and uh well you wouldn't recognize it brian but it's seems to be heavily Final Fantasy XI inspired from the Treasures of Otter Gone expansion. Oh, I mean, I've, I just, th that's the one where you meet the, uh, the red haired, they're not Mikotes in Final Fantasy XI. What are the cat people called? Mirthras? Mithras? Mithra, you meet yeah. the, you meet the red haired one who's like the, uh, the treasure hunting captain. I just barely started that expansion before I fell off that game. That's when I started moving last year and I never got back. But that's kind of cool that they're able to like take that aesthetic from Final Fantasy XI and carry it here, and in, in, at least in like spirit, if not directly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's also going to be a new PvP mode that is completely uh, replacing uh, the old The Feast. It's called Crystalline Conflict. It's hard to explain. It's a fast-paced kind of uh, payload type PvP mode. I'm gonna have to try it to figure out how it feels and what it's like. Uh, it has a <laughs> free battle pass like attached to it for each season, which is weird. So it's like they're they're definitely trying something incredibly different. Uh, there will be a new 24 player alliance raid. So the first uh, alliance raid in the new Myths of the Realm series. Uh, there is the extreme trial for the final Endwalker trial, at least as of right now. Patch 6.2 will introduce another trial that will have an extreme along with it and so on and so forth. But the currently missing extreme trial will be available with patch 6.1. And um, Yoshi P has outright said to expect it to be pretty difficult. Um, in the past, he has said that these... Uh, Pen ultimate extreme trials are designed to be like a stepping stone between extreme trials and savage raids in the sense that they're supposed to be tougher and more comparable to like the first and second fight of that savage raid tier. Um, and some of the wording he's used makes it sound like it might be even tougher this time because it is the last boss of 14 story so it's like he wants it to live up to that especially since it'll be who knows how long until we'll have the chance to play to do an ultimate raid that's based off of the end walker uh, msq so we'll have the to less see people that clear it the better to him I, I do feel that the last boss from Shadowbringers, like the post story last boss, is hard as a savage raid, in my opinion. I find yeah, the yeah. version is yeah, it's 
it, it's it's funny because it's like I, I I put out a tweet about that saying, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if this is a uh, harder than Seed of Sacrifice Extreme. Then all of those like tryhards on Twitter are like, oh, Seed of Sacrifice Extreme isn't hard. And it's like, go back and look at the mechanics and then look at the mechanics of the Savage Raids. You're having rose colored like glasses on really, really hard right now because like Seed of Sacrifice Extreme had a lot of mechanics. And the fact that it was randomized also meant that you actually had to know the mechanics instead of just memorizing the order of events, which is something that you can definitely do for a lot of uh, fights in uh, 14. Yeah, it took me longer to learn that fight than, uh, let's say, Eden 9 Savage. So it was like... Also, there are- a lot of those... Also, a lot of those people that like, make a big point about it easy. It's like, yeah, I'm sure this uh, extreme trial will be easy for me, but I, I mean... I, I've cleared the current Savage tier. Anyone that's cleared the current Savage tier, you know what you're getting into. And the Extreme Trial isn't really for you this time unless you're grinding for them out. No, if you've cleared the current Savage tier, that's what the ultimate is for. <laughs> Which, of course, we're also getting the uh, Dragon Song uh, War. Oh, Dragon Song uh, War. I, what's the name of the ultimate specifically? Uh, uh, Dragon the- Song War Ultimate? I, I forgot. Uh, the, the Dragon Songs Reprise, that's what it's called. Um, so yeah, it's uh And that's the first ultimate ball. uh for from Endwalker. Yeah, yeah the first it, of at least two uh, Heaven's yeah, Lord. yeah, the first of at least two uh ultimates coming in Endwalker, uh, because we also have been sh- told that we are going to be getting another uh ultimate in patch six point three. Who knows if we'll get anything for patch six point five. Probably not, but yeah, this will be the first ultimate event walker. So and it'll be I do first wonder since Go like the Epic of Alexander, which was the only ultimate that we got for uh for uh Shadowbringer. So it's been over two years since we got an ultimate, as far as I can tell. So it's 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 been a bit a, a bit of a wait. I do wonder if the new story stuff, like right now. Final Fantasy XIV's narrative has been completely linear in terms of uh, you play the expansions in sequence. And I do wonder if at any point when they're leading into the future of the game, if there's going to be like an alternative entry point for people who are just experiencing the story, or if there's this expectation that you still play through Heaven's Sword and oh, what's the second one? So- Stormblood, Shadowbringers, Endwalker. I don't know. Yeah. It, it'd just be interesting to see the, if there's the, if the paradigm shift is there, like a major shift where since this is a new continent, that this is a new starting point, or if it's still the expectation that if you want to play Final Fantasy XIV, that you play what leads up in the order it came out. And the reason why I think that that still might be the case is because I'm seeing in the in the notes here how they're introducing the duty support system so that earlier stuff from A Realm Reborn and it looks like later Heaven's Ward is very solo friendly in terms of being able to just use um, NPC support for uh, scenario dungeons and things like that. So making it just one thing. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. That's also one thing they're doing with patch 6.1 is that they're um, implementing um, trusts for uh, all the base game A Realm Reborn stuff. So anything up through the Ultima weapon is uh, besides some trials. Uh, is now going to be soloable. You'll be able to just use Trust for them. Um, The Aroma Born patches will come, I believe, with 6.2, and then like uh, um, going forward, they'll continue that until by the time 7.0 will be coming out, all of uh, Aroma Born, Heaven's Word, and Stormblood should be doable with uh, Trust, except for, again, the exception being trials and whatnot. which makes sense um but yeah that's the major thing uh there's new uh tribal quests which uh we expected that um job adjustments uh we expected that like i'm not going to go over all the minutia of what they've uh already mentioned because there's also plenty of uh, changes that they're very ex- they've very explicitly stated that everything that they've said is only a small bit like a small portion of the changes to expect when the patch drops and nobody comes to us for patch information about uh 14 if they want that they can go to nova crystallis or they can go to the uh 14 separate uh 
I guess the last big thing is adventuring plates or adventure plates, uh, which is a new feature that lets players customize like a portrait and information about themselves that they can that people can examine if they right click you. So it's a new way of like sharing some information about your like play schedule, what types of content you do, and also giving you access to a nice little portrait that's like kind of uh, like a like an isolated G pose that you can just uh, save and whatnot. And well, will it give me info on the color of uh, child's damage numbers parser thing? Oh, unfortunately not. Well, not interested then. If I can't what? just immediately judge you on whether you're doing your job or not. Child. Well, anyway. I got, I got purple as a healer <laughs> and uh, two weeks ago, but I, we didn't upload the parse because someone died there. So we didn't want to, embarrass the situation oh oh chow you, you just admitted to the worst santa parsing you're supposed to upload everything you can't cherry pick oh no Ch- <laughs> i wasn't I the one who died though well, but Dang. you were the one who but you were playing healer you let him die oh, oh fuck oh. <laughs> i think i exposed you accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's like a hook oh, in, yeah. like, a, like an add-on oh yeah uh chow congrats on your uh, p4s phase one clear i just uh uh, noticed. Oh, I actually cleared it before. I cleared it like several times, but we never uploaded the parse for that one. This one is just like a random party finder, and they upload the parse without yeah. my permission. So <laughs> they're they're supposed to upload everything, Chow. Oh no, Chow. <laughs> like, Final whoa. Fantasy fourteen rating community. I don't claim him. <laughs> but yeah, I, I cleared the first one. Uh, I tried to clear it with my static. Uh, we're still. I think we're in act three we've made That's, four ones but uh, act three is the one where you have the four thorns on either side and yeah then, someone bait yeah, yeah yeah that's 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 one of the harder ones uh act four is also a bit of black well, four it's more of uh just doing it fast enough the actual like mechanic isn't too crazy it's just like you have to do it quick enough. I, I understand all the mechanics it's just yeah. like you just need to like experience death a few times before you get the yeah. timing down what to do that's kind of like yeah. the savage raids in a nutshell you just need so, to die so speaking of which do you think you're going to have p4s cleared in time for uh, patch 6.11 are you going to try and do the ultimate uh that was the whole idea with the static group i signed up for they want us to clear this before the patch comes out so we can get ready for ultimate I, I'm not sure we're we're at that level yet, but we do want to try it. So, well, good luck. I believe in Chow. and Chow, he'll he'll get it done. I'm not sure if so- I should believe in Chow when he's not uploading all of his parses. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we I do not condone bullying on this podcast, so we'll have to we'll have to move on. But we will follow up with Chow. You know, now you've promised us that you will clear. Savage of this fight in Final Fantasy Fourteen. Look, I clear, I clear Savage Eden, okay, and that is harder than this tier. I would, I promise you. All right, so we have a few. Uh, I say smaller things in the back half of the news here, but not really. Like this, is, normally we reserve this for like some release dates and things like that, some delays. But actually, here we got a global release of Nino Kuni Cross World, which which is a mobile MMORPG that released in Japan and Korea uh, and Taiwan last summer. So we got both an official like announcement trailer as well as kind of like an like the, uh, a collection of the animation cutscenes that set the premise of the story for Cross Worlds, and I think it looks pretty neat, even though it doesn't give a lot of indication of how the game plays. Though of course, since it is has been out for half a year uh, in Japan, that you can just look that up if you want to. But for some reason, I don't know if this is the case, but. I feel like I have to ask Josh, who has his finger on wow. the of these things, about <laughs> whether or not you think this is, I don't know, like, have you, what do you know, if I ask you just straight out what this game's reputation is from its release last summer in Japan? Is that something that you're aware of or no? Because I, I heard have it's pretty no popular. Idea. Like, it actually, I, like, made, like, like, top charts for a bit. Yeah, um, I heard it made bank on its, like, first week or something. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how it's doing these oh, days. Next time I'll have to ask very... Chow, too. Yeah, it was very popular. I don't know if it's still popular. I know it still gets like updates. I like I, I searched up like oh what's it doing these days? And it's like adding it's still adding stuff. So 
I don't know. I mean, that seems cool. I have no idea like how how well M- uh, mobile MMOs do these days. That I'm like definitely not in that sphere. But oh, it, I never specified. By the way, uh, set for a global release this summer. So yeah, uh, the the announcement trailers are for an upcoming summer release for all markets. Yeah, I mean, it seems that like all the core systems you'd think of like a level five game, like it has like town building. It even has like all sorts of different PvP modes. Um, I, I think this like plays up more like an action RPG. Uh, so like it's not like turn based or anything. It, I I assume it's gonna be like sort of like Nino Kuni too. Um, but I don't know too much about it, like in terms of like what you actually do in the game. To be honest, like. I I never really looked into like it because I was like I I'm not gonna play this because uh, I I don't know if I like I like mobile MMOs like I think I'm not I'm not built for MMOs anymore did, did I tell you I uninstalled Lost Ark the other the other day <laughs> you you, oh. you told I remember you told me that but I forget if it was in a podcast or not so yeah I, maybe I, not I, admitting I, publicly yeah uh, like did I, it got too grindy for you or it just... like, yeah I just I just wasn't interested in the end game anymore I'm like I don't want to like do dailies anymore and like take up like because it became it, it got to the point like oh man i don't want to boot this game up like i have i have other things to do today and i don't want to do my dailies and it's like eh, okay and, and i'm thinking if it ever if it if it, it's not reaching that point and like i feel like it's a chore to play this game i'm gonna cut it off so yeah i agree with that sentiment so like i don't know like if mobile mmos i've never really played on a mobile mmo so maybe this is what i'll try out and see if i like it but I don't know. It's it, it, it's apparently really good. It's a that's all I hear about. It. It's like it's actually pretty good. But uh, it's outside of like that, I don't really know much about this Nino Kuni thing. I think it's all already weird that like the new Nino Kuni game is a mobile MMORPG after Nino Kuni two. Well, we should try try it and see the prologue. Is that yeah, are, yeah, yeah, we're, 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 a from a nuke? Are, are you gonna try it, Chow? Are you gonna try it with me? Sure, whatever it's R- out. RPG site plays. We'll have a collab yeah. event of some sort. A <laughs> collab event. I, 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 I feel like I am witnessing a blood pact from which cannot be undone. <laughs> <laughs> or just like, all right, child, if I, if I, if I, you'll, you'll jump with me, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll swear this vow in the peach tree or whatever it's called. <laughs> Yeah, like the three kingdoms. Yeah, yeah. yeah and great. when one brother dies, the next one will die. Jesus. Like, well, all right. I, we, we said it publicly. We, it cannot be undone. I do think it's interesting that uh, the premise of this game is I've never played either Nino Kuni game. I've heard obviously the stories about how Nino Kuni 2's opening works. And in this game, it seems similar, like that. Like a big premise is this two world duality, like the real world and the whatever you call the Nino Kuni world. Oh, I'm really excited. I, I thought I thought you were gonna go with like, oh, it opens up the same way as Nino Kuni two. You'll just no. fucking have a gun. Uh, I'm, all, all I all I know is based on the uh, the announcement trailer for the global release. It looks very much like in the premise of the world, it's a VR MMO that the main character, like the avatar, the stand in for the player, meets like a, a person that he knows in real life in this a very sort of online ish kind of aesthetic where like it's a game within a game in the premise of this MMO, which I don't mm-hmm. know if that aligns with how the other games worked. I, I kind of always thought that Nino Kuni one was completely straight laced. It just took place in a fantasy game. But then I heard There's about how no Nino Kuni VR MMO stuff before that's only for this cross world thing. Yeah, so that's an interesting take where I don't know if it actually plays into the story premise much at all or not, but uh, it's very evident in the in the uh, at least in the animation trailer, I think maybe in both trailers, but OK, it'll come out this summer and we'll, I guess, maybe apparently have promised or pacted to uh, at least get our toes wet. <laughs> Uh, here's one that is more of a just a straightforward little news, you know, blip, and that is that Yis Eight Lacrimosa of Dana uh, will release on PlayStation Five this fall. Obviously, it's already on many other consoles, including Stadia. Does that count? I don't know. Uh, yes, it always counts. But we'll get a PlayStation Five specific release uh, fall 2022. No, no date specific than that. I. It's kind of weird. Like I feel like anyone who's wanted to play this game already has, but I. Maybe maybe you yeah. haven't. So yeah, I think the interesting thing about this is the stuff that's kind of unsaid. 
because uh, so Durante um, team PH3 uh, mentioned during their uh, Trails from Zero um, AMA on Reddit that the Switch version of Trails from Zero was actually being done by them and that they are branching out into doing console ports in addition to PC ports. And people have looked at the screenshots for the PS5 version and compared it to the HBO Plus uh, setting on PC and have found that this is definitely based off the PC version. So it well, seems, neat. yeah, so it seems likely that this is just like an opportune first like dive into PlayStation 5 porting for Durante's team because obviously they're they're super familiar with the EZ code base because they've worked on it for PC, Stadia, etc. So I mean it makes sense that if they if they're interested in working on PS5, maybe Falcom wants PS5 games, maybe Nisa wants PS5 games and as well another reason to just market this again. It's like, it's not a massive announcement, but when you consider everything, it's like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. And it's like, hey, I wonder what this means for the future, because it's like, obviously, they're trying to get used to porting games to PS5. What does that mean going forward? Well, we already talked about how Trails from Zero, the English version, official version, is interesting and neat because it's the first time in a while that we're getting a game from a Falcon Games with, obviously, it's been in Japan for a decade now but several we're not getting the staggered release of first the sony port then the pc then the switch but like like has been so regular over the last several years so if this is just another stepping stone to having if ph3 is involved with nisa's porting efforts more multiple console day and date releases that's i don't know that's some good intuition there so i'm glad you were here to kind of like point that out as a potential like under the under the waves sort of note for this little seemingly benign announcement there won't be any new content in this will there oh no no i'm guessing it, 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 it bundles it. any of the dlc that already released into yeah it. I, th- I think the most significant thing would be like the splits uh, or the not split screen the the co-op feature if that, that'll make it in or not because they eventually added that to ec pc it was like a would, weird experiment you know, that's, feature. That, that's a good point would i'm not sure if that would actually pass like sony cert though that's the only thing because it. Was, i kind of assume that a that lot was of a... fun but it's really janky. So. Oh, I kind of assumed that that was leveraging like Steam's uh, capability there, and would be something can, that I wouldn't expect in the Sony port. You can definitely do it with remote play together, but you can also do it locally. And I actually uh, did play a uh, couple of hours of Vs8 locally with a friend of mine a few years back. So it's like it works well, but it's also like very janky. And I, again, I'm not sure if it would pass through. Well, it's, I'm guessing it's obviously like the game wasn't built with that in mind. It's kind of a, an yeah, afterthought. Yeah. Well, but. And what specifically I mean is that if uh, the two characters are far enough, basically when you're playing in co-op, the uh, automatic camera tries to zoom out to accommodate for both players. And that means in certain sections, like in the first real dungeon, the uh, coral reef, it gets, oh, you're, 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 it gets really, really bad sometimes. Oh, uh-huh. Like behind that PS5 work. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one game that we talked about, uh, actually a series of games that we talked about back on one of the January editions of our podcast, I think our podcast from the second to last week of January, was the uh, upcoming English release of Volus the Phantasm Soldier Collection for Switch, which was, which was, I believe, released in February. And I believe at the time, Chow was able to talk at most about having first-hand experience these games when they first released on the, was it Sega Saturn? Uh, no, there were for the PC uh, 88, and they were ported to PC Engine and stuff. Ah, okay. Uh, but uh, this game kind of has the same experience as Yeast does. Um, their second game, what is it? Uh, has like a PC port, and there was a PC Engine port that was made at the same time by a different uh, developer, so it, it told us it's just two different stories of the same game, you know, kind of thing, right? Well, let me let me get to the lead here, and the lead is is that Valus the Phantasm Soldier Collection Two has also been announced for Switch, and this includes yeah. some of the games that you had mentioned in our previous discussion were missing from the original collection, including Ballast 4 for the PC Engine, as well as some of these alternative games that you had mentioned, like for the Genesis. Yeah, and uh, those games aren't really good, 
but I'm guessing they just want to milk <laughs> You heard it here base. first. These games so, aren't yes. very good. <laughs> yeah, the spinoff games are not good. And I don't know. Like, I just feel like, Dan, it's a cash grab trying to sell this collection. And I feel like there would be one more collection if they really wanted to like bring all the like the PC edition ports because the PC version of number two is the best version, and I swore by the PC version. Uh, and that's currently people... not in either collection. Yes, because uh, the PC engine version, um, the combat's completely changed, the story's completely changed. Um, what is it? I but if they were going to release the PC version, I don't think they could like get past the ratings. It would have to get like a mature rating because there's like this one scene with a bad guy literally holds like the goddess hostage and he tells the main character to take off her clothes and she literally takes off her clothes and then he kills the goddess later by like stabbing right through her heart and you see like all this pile of blood. I don't know if that could get past the rating boards these days, right? So yeah, maybe it, not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think that'll get past like the teen rating and, and stuff like that. And yeah, so you know, maybe that's why they never go go for it. But um, all the halcyon some... days of when we could get games of the same title released on two different systems, and they were just completely different games. Yeah, but you know, it's like the story is like the main villains is like really sympathetic in the PC engine version, while in the original PC version, he was just a scumbag that will do everything to try to kill you, and that was it. Because uh, how the second game goes is like the typical revenge story because the emperor was killed in the original game the demons need to find someone to take over and and he decided to go for a full relentless assault to invade the human world and kill the person that killed their emperor which is you in the original game so that's basically the concept of valus 2 uh which i hope they have the pc version ported somehow because it's a pain in the ass to set up those pc 88 computers or pc 98 depending on what you want to get and there were no other details made with the announcement here. So obviously the, the Valus the Phantasm Soldier collection is available on Switch. The Collection 2 was announced for Switch, but without any further details about uh, when it's going to release in either region or any region, just other, other than the fact that it announces that it has been announced and it contains Valus 4 for PC Edge and Sid of Valus for Genesis and Valus the Phantasm Soldier for Genesis. So announced, but no other details past that. When are these coming to Steam, Chow? I'll... Uh... Gotta just pray. Just gotta pray for it. Go pray. All right. Well, all right. I'll, I'll talk to God tonight. I'm like, come on, please release Valis on PC for Steam. <laughs> so here is a news post that Josh put in late that I do not know if I can speak to uh, authoritatively, and that is for a Dungeon Fighter Online spin-off action RPG that was announced a few years back under the title Project BBQ. And it was has been in development since at least 2018, but has been kind of silent on the developer's front at, am I pronouncing this right, Neopol? Mm -hmm. And now it has undergone a code name change. It is now Project AK and has been confirmed as a Souls-like action RPG for console. So to summarize that in a quick sentence, it is a Dungeon Fighter Online spin-off action RPG, Souls-like in style under the current title project ak so first of all i'm not familiar with what dungeon fighter online is i don't uh, know dungeon if fighter, yeah the dungeon fighter online is like one of the og like korean mmos but it, it was very unique because it was like a very beat-em-up streets of rage style game it's like a 2d based you can go up and down the lane and then like you you travel uh forward but like, you know left and right and um and go beat up stuff and then like it's very much played like a a very flashy Streets of Rage, let's say, uh, like a, with a lot of like DMC s combos and long, really long like life bars. Like like the life bars for like bosses will be like, okay, there's this life bar, but there's like this boss has like a hundred life bars, you know. <laughs> They're like going through, like shredding through it, and it's very over the top flashy. Um, and it, it 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 came to Steam a while back, but it was like it, it had its own separate client years ago. It's a very old game at this point that's still being updated. And of course, they have the DNF dual um, fighting game that's coming this summer. Right now, as we're speaking, they're having a second open beta test that I've been playing, um, which is a lot of fun. But this pro Project Barbecue game um, was really cool because it was like a 3D take on the game. It was very flashy, uh, you know, your, your standard uh, 3D action game. But it was like it, it was crazy. It looked like a very combo heavy, flashy like the game. And now I don't, I don't know what's going on with development in this game, but now they're like 
I don't know if they're actually like shifting the focus off of that or not, because now they're like describing it through Gamatsu's transla- rough translation of the Project AK description now. Uh, but now they're calling it uh, as an Unreal, Unreal Engine based console platform, Souls like stylish action RPG. Puts the action of fun at first and foremost. Uh, and aims to provide next generation Dungeon Fighter Online you know, action. You know. So. I, I, but they, they didn't release any new footage of it, just like a new description that calls it a Souls-like. So that's interesting. I wonder if there's like, oh, okay, like maybe they're just implementing the structure. Now it'll have like its bonfire equivalents and you level up at bonfires. Who knows? But that's uh, that's kind of a weird weird thing. Like because Yeah, no all really the existing that. footage for this game is under the Project BBQ label and everything that's coming out of this new like shift to this Project AK is through like, pages looking to hire you know graphic artists programmers planners for this project so yeah a lot of this was kind of gleaned from the back end and not through an official announcement of here's what we're planning to develop it's more of come join us to help us plan development yeah, of this. Well, yeah i really wonder because they, they've spent a lot of time on like up to this point i wonder what what that development looks like now has that a lot of that been scrapped or maybe being reworked or what like what is this thing going to come out it's been a while so a lot of people have been looking forward to because it, it like it looks really cool but who knows what it looks like at this point so who knows you know the 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 dnf is still a very 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 popular series not not necessarily uh, in here over in the west but over in asia that's gigantic um so yeah didn't you get to try the fighting game beta recently yeah i, I played i played it a, a bit last night i'm gonna play it more today they added ghost blade as the new character in it and he he plays like persona 4 arena one not narukami Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, kind of fighting that guy. Yeah. He's he, that, that's a weird thing. Like he's he's like pretty cool. He's like really like fun to control and play. But the like I think his main weakness is he has no anti airs. So like I don't know. Yeah, weird character. But yeah, that game is still cracked. It's still what you, they didn't make any like big big changes to it from the first beta. But you know, it's it's still a lot of fun if not stupid. But you know, it, that's that's okay. We did also get another look at the upcoming Soul Hackers 2. This was a effectively a kind of primer video about the combat and how it works. This was originally shown in a live stream, but now has been separated out into a standalone YouTube video that we've got linked in our news post. And I watched a bit of this, and a lot of it is very kind of familiar to anyone who's played a Persona game or an SMT game. I do not know, as people like Adam might be a little bit more well versed on that what, what whether this is more like once more or more like press turn or more like the original devil summoner uh or the, sorry the, the original soul hacker but it talks about how uh applying you know attacking enemies with an applied weakness to a certain element will buff up this stack counter which then will result in extra attacks from the attached demon doing extra damage based on how high you push this counter and there's more detail and nuance than that but it seems like kind of to me anyway, it's just like standard fare. And I'm it's not I didn't see anything there that really kind of took me by surprise. But just kind of it gave some more uh you got some more voice acting from the from the Japanese talent and some more of uh, just footage of obviously a lot of battle scenarios and things like that. And some of the demons you can see a bunch of borrowed kind of models from the uh from Shin Megami Tensei 5, which we kind of knew would happen. But it I don't know. I'm not I'm not promoting that. That's smart asset, you know. I don't know. I don't know if you call it borrowed. They're, they're very, very different stylistically, especially. Yeah, the, yeah, it looks like it looks also, a lot more like also, go ahead. Also, isn't like the angel like model the old design now yeah it's, it's still bondage angel now they might pack the bondage angel but even even if you st- stuff like um suchigomo like like uh, the where they put out like the 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 comparison between smt5 and like soul hackers 2 mo- models for that it's like they're both very different because there's like so hackers 2 was going for more uh, com- comic style cell shaded style definitely more expressive that's not that pops out at you, so I don't know. Like, you sure they may say uh, share the same base model, maybe, but they're very, very different graphically. I, I, Adam, I, well, how would you describe this battle system? Because I, I don't think it's really a one-to-one comparison to uh, what we've yeah, seen so before. I actually kind of disagree with Brian that the battle system seems standard fare because it seems Me too. <laughs> it's pretty oh. different. Like, you, what it is is you you let me pull up the my transcript here. You you hit a weakness, and then when you hit a weakness, your um, your demon will basically be added to a stack, 
I said, and this. then like at the no, yes, but at the end of it, so basically you're stacking like demons in, in literally a stack. No other game has done something like this. Oh, I didn't. I didn't, at I didn't the end of the round. That. Okay, I'll let you go. At the end of the round, all the demons that you've basically stacked up do like an all-out attack. They call it a sabbath, and or a sabbath is how you pronounce it. And uh, so they say you can have up to like sixteen demons in a sabbath, and you basically do like a combination attack. And then there are certain demon skills that can take place during a sabbath, and so like that's a new sort of system. It, it, it sort of reminds me of uh, Demon Co-op in Strange Journey, but it's not yeah, quite that either. Not quite. It's, it's, it's like you're like building up like a, like a demonic ritual because like uh, as you're talking about your tandem skills, like there'll be like skill, skills you can put on demons and then they have a chance to proc during these Sabbaths that will like can inflict ailments or like heal your party members or give you buffs or do more damage. So it's a definitely a different take on like systems that we've seen somewhat before, but definitely presented in an all new way it, it's unlike any other battle system we've seen even though like the the different components of it are similar to some past games and there's also I, I, a section of this uh, video that talks a little bit about the character relations between arrow milady and uh one of the other four the guy with yeah, that's name I I it's whatever yeah it's it's, it's story but bits that's like who, who cares at this point that the story is the story right like uh, it doesn't that that doesn't we'll, really, we'll get to encounter that firsthand yeah play it. yeah mm -hmm. that, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't really interest me the the thing that interests me is like definitely the way they're presenting battles i do hope that there is like a some sort of toggle or speed up system for this because i can imagine like they do have like elaborate animations for this for these sabbath rituals but like i can see that getting tiresome very fast too if it's like for every encounter that's just happening because it, it it definitely looks like the game is balanced and tuned to like like exploit this system as much as possible and I yeah it seems like that. the general like strategy in gameplay here is to like i know obviously in smt games you always want to you're always going to go for weaknesses but like on it rather than like press turn system you just get additional turns if you hit weaknesses now it's you're basically every I guess you have there's five characters in the game i don't know if you you have all five of them in battle at some point eventually but um, you build up as many stacks as possible before before each Sabbath, and then you like you do like these super attacks every round. I guess it's, like that's a little bit different. Yeah, I, so, I really wonder how that how that'll manifest like in actual like often like what optimized gameplay looks like in this game because you know like for other system for other past games like you know you'd want to buff yourself up before going mm -hmm. on the offense. But I wonder if like if like tandem skills are the way to go this time around where you're 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 giving yourself buffs through tandem. So you're 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 working up your like your DPS optimization through doing ta through exploiting tandems. That yeah, and, and on your note about like character or like demon animations, it it reminds me of the original version of Tokyo Mirage Sessions where <laughs> oh, by yeah. the end of that game, like in the final dungeon when you've unlocked uh all the different like linking skills you just hit one weakness and then literally you'll have like 10 different link attacks come oh, into you're play right. this, this is like that fucking system i didn't think about yeah, that I, I I, i'm not a big fan of tokyo mirage sessions but I, I absolutely detested you can skip it in the switch version but in the original version you could not yeah and it literally took like I'm gonna. I don't want to like exaggerate, but it's like 10, 15 seconds for an attack where you like hit an attack, and then it's like, all right, wait, one, two, three, <laughs> four. Well, all the attacks are linking up, and there's yep. nothing you can do. Yep. And then sometimes they'd have like the inset, like like little like song bits and whatnot that even take even longer. And it's like 10 seconds later, all right, next attack. All right, one, two. <laughs> Yeah. Three, literally i was just like this is like i'm like checking twitter i'm just like while i'm <laughs> it was a drag and it sucked anyways i don't think hopefully this isn't that bad because you're only doing these uh every like round instead of every attack but still that's what it reminded me of shit you're right well sorry for saying that it seemed very conventional because you've, you've convinced me that it seems kind of different so. i can't believe you compared to persona right away the easy smooth brain take brian well, it's, I played, so it's I played like, one it's like Persona neither... game and one Shin Mikami Tensei game and one Devil <laughs> Survivor game. So I've I've gotten the my base is covered at a at like the minimum possible level. You can't even it blame me seem for like, like it's quite 
press turn or once more, which are the yeah. SMT and uh, Persona in Persona versions. I'm glad that's doing something different. That's yeah. good. And the uh, the very last thing here that I guess we'll close out with. Uh, a few months back, we talked about how the summer event of gaming, how E3 was not going to be held in LA's convention center this year. There was still like a little bit of a crack opening for potentially another digital event that would substitute E3 like they had that weird online portal the last couple of years or whatever, or one of the last two years. And maybe we would still have it. But no, uh, this year there is no physical E3 as we knew, and there will be no digital showcase as well, at least not under the ESA and under the E3 banner. So there is no E3 this year in any capacity, which I know some people who are very like classically or traditionally minded or have good nostalgic memories are bummed out about, but some people maybe more, I don't know, more optimistic, I guess, say like, we don't need it anymore. We have plenty of other opportunities like Nintendo Directs and uh, PlayStation, what are they called? PlayStation, Play, what are PlayStation Directs called? State of play. State of play. That's a mouthful. That's no wonder I didn't remember that. Yeah. So some people say that, you know, and we have, uh, we obviously have like, uh, yes. Um, well, the thing Jeff is, Keeley, like Summer last year's digital game. event, the, the E3 portal for last year's digital event was basically <laughs> worthless. <laughs> um, so, like, for example, Capcom held an E3 stream last year. And it wasn't very big. They just had like a few updates on like Monster Hunter stories or Resident Evil 8 DLC or something like that. And then they'd release like the press release with all the media and the trailers. And they'd upload the whatever it was. And the only benefit for it for them being a part of E3 was literally just to kind of say they were like we're an E3. We, we, it's literally like spend money to the ESA to say we're an E3 stream. When, like, this year, if Capcom wants to hold a summer stream, they can do that. It just yeah. won't be an E3 stream. Or same with, like, Square Enix if or Nintendo. Like, Nintendo wants to do a Nintendo Direct in June. Sure. I mean, I think, I I think it's just a lot of fun memories, like, you know, a lot of angles from E3. Because, obviously, like, on the ground floor, like, if you're yeah. attending there, easy way to network with everyone from the fucking industry. Yeah. Uh, is there so it's easy to link up with people and like see what you needed to see from publishers and developers and uh, on top of like you know getting to go out with other people uh, yeah the, the event I'm, I'm gonna miss like i, I hope yeah. like if e3 2023 is in person and hopefully the coronavirus isn't like terrible like i, I it, it the the memory of actually like going to the event um you know it's fun yeah like it's being with people that we don't get to be with very often in person and seeing like you know all the different developers and publishers and pr people and other writers in all in one spot like it's yeah. a fun like event but in terms of like its utility that's when it's like is it worth it yeah i mean the, the like utility part like for other people who like you who even further back than that like when people like when a lot more publishers did like uh their grand theatric like uh press conference days you know uh, and like where all the big, big, big reveals would be, would be there. Like who knows uh, what what's Sony going to show? What's Microsoft going to show? You know that like that. To a lot of people who you know watched E3 and experienced E3 like that, that was you know legitimately like fun, very fun time. It's like it's like almost like a Christmas gift uh, that week of like you just didn't know what to expect from the big, big you know announcements. And a lot of people like enjoy those theatrics. And then you know there's also uh, also another set like older E3s where like some of them were just like downright embarrassing. You know you'd have like awkward moments of e3 he, he, he'd have the communal cringe session at like konami yeah. 2010 or whatever that yeah. was and someone more clever yeah. than me could bounce off that utility argument and be like this is the utility outcome but what about my liberty and mor morality <laughs> or whatever <laughs> <laughs> i want my e3 damn it but i really think that show last year did more harm to the games than than advertise i feel like you know as a company it's like it's better to show nothing than show what they show last. It, 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 it is weird because like when like that's expectations around like E3 streams, E3 announcements, like when you people, you know, when they go to E3 and they see something E3, they expect like, oh, you know, this company is going to have like something big to announce because they're at E3, whether it's digital or in person, like E3 is like what that event to a lot of people that are like, oh, this is when like the craziest shit happens and gets announced, you know, and it's just very much not that anymore. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to a lot of factors, you know, that, not just Corona, but the way that 
the ESA has been taking E3 on like the directions been taken even before Corona, like in a weird way. Like even remember before like the Corona even hit, like that ESA announcement on that January 2020, like they were gonna like transform the event to like uh like it's like for for influencers and celebrities and like have these like weird spaces to like experience with them and it's like what the fuck is this you know so it's just it's a, it's kind of a uh, you know i'm not gonna like put too much like stock on like oh yes e3 was everything but there is a certain amount of like sentimental value um with the the e3 brand itself well i guess we'll see what Mr. Keeley has in store for Summer Games Fest this year. And then obviously yeah. just all the publisher specific summer events or whatever gets announced. That that's always the the weird thing about this. Is like anything that happens to E3, especially if it's something like bad, you can be be, be sure to know that there's gonna be a Jeff Keeley tweet uh, shortly running after. Mm-hmm. Like, ah, but things are going uh, swell here. Two thumbs up. It's like oh, and, ho- and hopefully like, still plenty of cringe on that front as well that we can all mutually enjoy. Yeah, Keely, it's always funny just seeing him like he's always waiting behind the ESA's back with the knife. And it's just like yeah. he, he found his moment. He's just very like, opportunist, opportunistic. And, you know, the, the, I respect the hustle. I mean, I have no love for the ESA lost. I mean, if anything, I'm glad they're dead. They they doxed me. I think they doxed everyone in this call except for uh, <laughs> Chow. <laughs> No, Chow's Chow a god, okay? That no one can dox him. No one knows where the fuck you can find this guy besides our podcast. Yeah, that's yeah, you, true. In the YouTube Twitter. comments <laughs> of uh, the triangle strategy ending. So. I don't comment, guys. He's reading them, though. You know how to get a hold. <laughs> if you want him to read something you have to say, just find find the ending trailer or the ending cutscene of a, of a recent RPG and just say, Chow, I know you're reading this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, the um, ESA says at the very last like line says we are looking forward to presenting E3 to fans around the world from Los- live from Los Angeles in 2023. Whether that holds up or not, because who knows what the world looks like next year. I'm sure someone's got a photograph of the banner of usually at the end of the of the weekend. They're like, "See you next year," and they announce right. the dates for the next year. So, what did that banner say on the, uh, Sunday in June of 2019? Like, "See you." next year and <laughs> like famous last words no, 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 no. yeah <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's a fa- famous last word for a lot of things really. yeah, yeah well that uh that covers us for this podcast so thank you so much for listening we have like i like we started at the at the top of this podcast a lot of features up on the site that is including the reviews for the kaito files dlc of lost judgment the cruel king and the great hero we've got the two interview features from rune factory 5 some Rune Factory 5 guides, and uh, an Elden Ring feature as well, as well as the Pokemon feature. So I just rattled off a lot of things there, but just go to rpgsite.net and give those a read of whatever you're interested in, including also all the news that uh, Adam and Kite and others, Andrea, have put together, making sure that all this stuff stays captured and uh, cataloged up there. You can find us on all the social media platforms, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram under RPG Site, And listen to us next week for another episode of the Tetracast as we go into the month of April and maybe by next week will we be uh having our hands on Chrono Cross? Doesn't that come out the seventh? Yep. When does Chrono Cross come out? I would buy that so. just for the radical dreamers. I wouldn't care about Chrono Cross. So yeah, uh so our next recording will be a few days after that comes out. So maybe we'll have some initial thoughts on there. We're looking forward to that. And maybe we'll get into some of the other games from March uh that we haven't had a lot of time to sink our teeth into. But until you hear from us next time Stay safe, take care, and we'll talk to you then. Later, everyone. Project Barbecue now.